Hello, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to Philbert Flies and to what should be a really, really interesting interview uh, with Robert Randazzo of, uh, of PMDG, firm, the CEO of PMDG. There is, there is one slight hitch, which is that uh, he's not here. He's not here yet. Uh, we did do a little technology check um, at seven o'clock, so an hour ago, and it was all fine. Um, but he's obviously been waylaid somewhere. So what we're going to do uh, is we're just going to spend a little bit of time, hopefully just having a little chat until until he arrives any minute now. I hope. I hope. Um, so who have we got in the chat? We have uh, Orbiter. Hello. We have <laughs> Nikki. Hello. We have Deep Fried Friday. Trolls. We're popping some champagne once he does. I have no booze in the house at all, boss. But you absolutely should. Julone, Alex. Trolls, I may have already said hello to you. Uh, M degree, Ollie, I am, I'm far too big, really. Tree, we went, uh, Will, uh, Mark, all kinds of people here and lots of new faces. So, so welcome one and all. And I promise you when he gets here that it is going to be uh, a fascinating interview. Finally, it was one year ago when I started to follow you and I will never stop. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Uh, how long will he be talking for? Well, it depends. We we did have a discussion about this. He's not got to rush off anywhere. So I guess it depends um, how long uh, well, how long the questions go on for. I reckon, you know, up to an hour and a half, something like that. Oh, truly, and bless you. Thank you very much indeed for the tier one resub. Uh, in a Phil that flies review style. What in a Phil that will Rob be reviewing my skills in the seventh three? I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> ah, he's here, I think. Rob, hello. Hello there. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good, I'm pleased. Now, uh, people can't see you at the moment. I don't oh, that's think. good. We can leave it that way. <laughs> Let me just have a little fiddle around with it, because last time you popped up, it did take a little while for your uh, view to be displayed as well. But it might be a new link. Let me add the new link. Um, good. I think we're done. We'll give it a minute. Um, there you are. Perfect. There he is. Uh, everyone, welcome. Welcome, uh, Robert Randazzo to the channel, uh, the CEO of PMDG, as I was saying. Um, now, Robert, thank you very much indeed for taking a bit of time out of your day to come and talk to us all. Oh, I'm glad to be here. You and I have been trying to arrange this for a while. so It has taken a while. Yeah, yeah. it has. I'm glad we're getting it done. Um, just a bit of an echo, I think, possibly because I've got you up in two windows at once. Let me just have a little look at that. Um, Right, because say something now. Have I muted you completely or just from this one window? Uh, I don't know. You tell me. Just that one window. That is perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, Will, thank you very much for the gifted subs. So everything's going to be slightly different to what you're used to seeing on my streams. There are going to be no sound alerts or anything like that, uh, unfortunately for you, um, because that would just interrupt the flow too much. And there's going to be no flying of planes either. So that's, that's another little change. Um, and what I thought we would do, Robert, is I've, I've split the questions that people asked in advance into four rough sections. Um, so a bit about you, a bit about PMDG, a bit about MSFS development past and present, and a little bit about your future plans. Um, and I've got some questions, uh, as I say, split into those topics. I will be keeping an eye on the chat. The moderators will be keeping an eye on the chat. And uh, if you have anything that you'd like to ask Robert, then post it at any time. And I'll sort of try and vaguely slot it into the right section. That is that is the plan anyway. Um, but it will no doubt get a bit jumbled up and that's fine too. Um, so Robert, very, very broad question to start off with uh, and tell me if it is too broad. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I, I'm a very private person. I hate doing live streams. Um, so we can start from there. The right. uh, <laughs> It's uh, no, I I um, I'm actually sort of perennially private. I I really don't do many of these. Um, you know, I've got a, a couple of friends in the community that that I'll visit with uh, on occasion, um, but for the most part, I tend to stick to myself. Um, so um, you know, I PMDG is is run out of uh, out of this space. Um, this is uh, an office located in my house. Um, I live just outside of Washington, D.C. We've been here for, well, my wife and I have been here off and on for 25 years. Um, uh, I was moved here uh, in a management position by United Airlines in the uh, early 90s. We spent 10 years 
in uh, northern Nevada, living out in the desert, which was magnificent. Um, our nearest neighbor was a couple of miles away, so uh, that that fit perfectly. Um, but um, we've got a daughter, and she needed to get a good education, so we moved back here to Washington D.C. and um, and she is um, she's getting a good education. Uh, a, a word of warning to anyone who's a parent or going to become a parent. Do not raise your child to be smarter than you. Um, <laughs> it um, it uh, keeps things interesting in the house. But um, uh, so uh, we moved back here about ten years ago, um, and uh, I, you know, work right out of here. All of PMDG is a um, is a big happy accident. Um, I uh, started PMDG really accidentally in in 1997. Um, I was. Uh, paying off all of the bills that I was accruing, learning to fly. And I needed about $3,000 to pay off the credit card so that I could go and get my instrument rating. And, um, you know, started this little hobby and realized that, you know, it would make some money. And um, one thing led to another and a couple of other people joined. And then in um, 2002, um, I had uh, was the chief pilot of a 120 a scheduled uh, part 121 air carrier here based in Washington, D.C. And you know, we had 1,800 pilots in our domicile and it was a fairly time consuming job. And I decided that I no longer needed to do PMDG. And um, my my mother, of all people, um, she uh, we were talking, I was visiting with them and she said, you know, she said, why don't you stick with that for a while? Uh, hmm. Just see where it leads. Um, and uh, right about the same time, a uh, fellow by the name of Mark Harrington, who um, was one of the original cast of characters in PMDG. He's now a, a um, uh, he's now flying for Lufthansa. Um, and uh, Vin Simone, who is still with us, he's been here 22 years, I think. Mm. Um, the two of them had this crazy idea and they brought it to me and said, hey, let's do a 737. And I thought, oh, this this will, you know, there are few airplanes in the world more boring than a 737. But um <laughs> So uh, one of many times that I have been spectacularly wrong in PMDG, mm. um, and we decided to do it, and you know, it kind of took off from there. And I loved it. Yeah, yeah proved 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 mum right. So yeah, um, gosh. But, so all uh, of this nearly nearly never happened. All of it nearly never happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if but you know, life is kind of like that, and that's one of the things that I've that I've learned along the way is that, you know, you start off with grand plans. Um, you know, I had, when I was my daughter's age, I had life entirely mapped out. I knew exactly what I was going to be doing and how long I was going to be doing it and, you know, when it would start and when it would end and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And I think about six months after I graduated high school, that train went off the rails. Um, and, um, it's pretty much been making it up as I go along since then. And, right. you know, the, um, it, it would be easy to look at the success that, PMDG has enjoyed and that all of us on the team have enjoyed and say, oh, you know, these guys are really super smart and they're, you know, everything. And the reality is we're, we're all pretty average. Um, mm -hmm. We have been spectacularly lucky. Um, timing and good fortune plays a great deal in, um, in any success and yeah. we've worked hard for it. Um, but, you know, if you had told me 25 years ago that I'd be doing this instead of flying all over the world, um, you know, for United Airlines, who was my employer at the time, I would have mm. laughed at you. Um, but, you know, here we are and I wouldn't trade what I'm doing now for anything. It's, uh, you know, I, I sleep in my own bed at night and, and uh, I'm very actively involved in, in um, my, my marriage and my, uh, my daughter's day to day life. And um, life is good. Very low That's stress fantastic. and very little jet lag, which is nice. Yeah, fantastic. So that sort of leads us fairly neatly onto what I wanted to ask you about next, which no. is, which is your well, not not your family <laughs> life, don't worry. But the, just before that, the flying bit, the flying oh, right. bit. <laughs> well, when you when you say that it was going to lead yeah, someplace yeah. you wanted to go, that tells me I've stepped into a trap. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. <laughs> no. So, your where did your flying career begin, and and did that come before the flight simming or after? Um. Well. You know, I, I think it depends on who you ask. I really fell out of the womb um, clutching an airplane model. I mean, I have been besotted with aviation as long as I can remember. And as, as, as long as my parents can recall, we grew up um, sort of underneath the, the ILS to uh, an Air Force base in Massachusetts. And 
you know, we had a dog and the dog would run around the yard looking up at airplanes and trip over things and everybody thought it was funny. And then their son started doing it and it wasn't quite so funny anymore. Yes. Um, but um, uh, I worked at uh, an FBO in Massachusetts um, at, at Hanscom Air Force Base. For those that, that live in and around the Boston area, you're familiar with that. Um, and uh, there was a, an FBO there called Beechcraft. And I walked in there um, at the age of 14 and asked for a job and they handed me the application and I filled it out. And there was the little box to check that says, are you over 18? And I it had yes or no. And I figured, well, I can't lie. I'll just leave it blank. And nobody noticed. So right. um, they offered me a job over the summer and then I went back to school and, you know, each summer I would I would work there. And then uh, the summer of my 18th birthday, they had a little birthday party for me because my birthday is in the middle of the summer. And my boss said, you know, now how old are you now? And I said, 18. And I got fired about 10 minutes later. Um, and oh, that's unfair. You had a light. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, that's, that was my first lesson. Welcome to aviation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, um, I tried to uh, go to the United States Naval Academy. Um, <clears throat> and the, uh, unfortunately, I was um, wasn't in direct competition with him, but, uh, you know, a, a fellow uh, that I went to high school with, who is a very dear friend of mine, significantly smarter than I am, was also trying to go to the Naval Academy. So um, long story short, I didn't get to go. Um, but uh, I, my whole plan was centered on going to the Naval Academy and then, you know, mm -hmm. flying F-14s, doing two tours in the Navy, getting out and working for United Airlines. So um, since that fell out of the chain, I figured, well, you know, I'll just go to work for United Airlines. So um, I walked out to, um, uh, I was living in Pennsylvania uh, at this point, and I went out to the airport and figured I was fairly smart, you know, well-spoken guy. They put me right into management. So I went out and applied and they gave me a job and I showed up and they gave me a set of glove, rubber gloves that came up to about here. And they pointed to a 727 and said, you know, that, that airplane has five lavatories clean them. And when you're done, start over. Um, and so, wow. you know, we had two overnighters and uh, from 10 at night to two in the morning, I cleaned lavatories. Um, and then I, they promoted me. I got to drive the little truck that when you empty the lav that, you know, where everything goes. Yes. And since I thought that was a promotion, they made me management. So um, <laughs> the, um, but, uh, but I had a, I had a fun career. It, it sort of wound its way through a couple of places. Um, the ambition was to fly. And yeah. I was in a, um, I was in a, a corporate management position. I was doing a lot of traveling. I had a, a fair amount of responsibility for the company and wound up sitting on an airplane next to a guy. Um, and it was leaving out of Washington national, which I can see out the window here. Um, and, uh, he, um, I could, t I knew just by how he was dressed that he was one of our pilots and, um, he could probably knew how I was dressed that I was management. So we weren't really talking but the second officer was getting rained on doing the walk around. It was February. And he commented that, you know, that poor bastard's getting soaked. And I said, I saw off my right arm to be that poor bastard. And <laughs> what, what came out of that was a conversation in which he really propelled me like, Hey, you know, you're, you're in your mid twenties. If yes. you want to do this, go do it. Um, and I found myself sitting at a, at a meeting at headquarters um, that afternoon. And, you know, it was, you know, bah, 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 bah. and I don't know what came over me because I've never really been much of a rebel. Um, but I got up, I picked up my briefcase because back then, you know, you still had one. I picked up my briefcase, walked out front of headquarters, got into a cab, went back to the airport, flew home, drove out to Manassas airport, um, walked in there still in my suit and said, I need to learn to fly. Um, and at this point, I probably had like 15 hours in a logbook. Um, and I wound up becoming good friends with the fellow who would become my flight instructor. And I went through all of my ratings in um, just about 18 months. I was pretty wow. determined. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, meanwhile, changed positions at United Airlines. And I was managing part of our international hub at Dulles. Um, and um, which, you know, was a, a wonderful job for somebody who loves airplanes. Um, mm. But um, I would leave that job at night and go across the airport and hop into an airplane. And, and I would just pick some place two hours away and I would fly out there and I would land, turn around, fly back. Um, and this is how I built flight time. And I I've lost track of how many times I nearly fell asleep flying an airplane. 
<clears throat> Those are long days, very long days. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and, uh, my wife, um, uh, my wife thinks that, you know, I, I don't sleep a whole lot. Um, and I, I, I sort of have a, 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 um, I have a troubled relationship with sleep and my wife thinks it's because I spent so much time keeping myself awake, flying an airplane. <laughs> if you fall asleep, you're dead, you know, that's yeah, that course, yeah. to it. So, um, so she thinks when I'm, you know, sitting in bed, you know, reading, trying, you know, desperately hoping that I'll get tired to fall asleep. She thinks there's some fallback from that. So, yeah, she, um, you're right. but, um, but I, you know, the, this, it, it, it's a huge industry. It's a wonderful industry. Um, almost all of my dear friends are, are in it in some capacity. And, um, you know, I, I was very low time. I had about 600 hours, um, 400 of which was multi-engine time. And I walked across the, um, the street to our regional affiliate, uh, was a company by the name of Atlantic Coast Airlines. And there was a fellow in there that I knew because I had been a ticket agent in Manchester, New Hampshire for a while. And he lived up there and he used to fly in and out all the time. And um, his, his name was Ken. And I, he was the only person I knew at ACA. And I walked in with my logbook and I put it down in front of him and he recognized me. And I pleaded with him to introduce me to whoever it was I needed to talk to to get a job flying. And, mm -hmm. and he said, hang on. And he went down the hall and then he came back with another fellow with suspenders and I've, and I've forgotten his name. Um, yeah. And the two of them asked me some questions and they took me down the hall and they sat me in their little procedure trainer that they used for interviews. And then they said, you know, come back, you know, whatever day it was, I think it was the 3rd of November. They're like, you know, come back on the 3rd of November and we'll interview you. Um, and it turns out that, that, um, uh, he was the, um, uh, the, the director of operations. So, yeah, yeah. um, so he knew the people that, <laughs> that right, I needed right. to know. Um, and they looked after me. Um, and I did the interview and, and I showed up for my first day as a new hire and they assigned me to the, the Jetstream 32. Um, and there's one on my shelf, I think right about there. It's kind of hard to see. Um, yeah. and I went through training and the J32 is a marvelously miserable airplane. Um, <laughs> it's, very difficult to fly with an engine out. Um, and, you know, the instructors kept apologizing to me because I was going to get fired. There was no way I was going to survive training. Um, and I was just determined I was going to, I was going to get through it. And I did. And I flew with some of the most incredible captains uh, in the industry. These are guys who had been stuck. There had been no forward progress for yeah. years. And, you know, they had five, seven, 10 years flying left seat in J32s, which, you know, should, that should qualify you for some kind of sainthood or something. Uh, <laughs> yes. But you know, you, you learn a lot about flying um, yeah. when your first day on the line is in a snowstorm in the winter time in February um, in the northeastern United States. It is nothing but ice and snow and and low IFR and nice. some of the most difficult, but some of the most fun flying I've ever done. So, um, and then yeah, you know, then I decided I didn't need PMDG anymore, and I've already told you the rest of the story. So it all yeah, worked. yeah. So and PMDG began alongside all of that. Uh, yes. So you were so you were doing both. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, for, just just to take a quick pause there, uh, a plateau and everyone else is asking questions. Thank you ever so much. They are very very good, and I'm going to slot them in um, a little bit later on. So yeah, do keep them coming, and the mods are, are highlighting them for me, which is great. Um, yes, I'm very curious about your personal aircraft. You you have a DC three. Am I, I right? To. Is it yours? You used to. Oh, yeah. what happened? So, um, <clears throat> well, the DC three started out um, as a mental illness. Um, yeah, I used right. to I think like a lot of aviation loving young boys. I, I built a lot of airplane models as a kid, and I, I mm -hmm. built a lot of I built a lot of seven twenty sevens, a lot of seven forty sevens, and a lot of DC threes. Um, mm -hmm. And I w have found myself with an opportunity. For um, that was really kind of dropped in my lap um, to fly a DC-3 with um, a fellow by the name of Clay Lacey, who is a, absolutely an unparalleled legend in aviation. Mm. And um, I wound up sitting right seat uh, flying his DC-3, is an immaculately restored DC-3. And at the time, I was thinking of purchasing a King Air, um, which, um, you know, in, in retrospect, would have been a horrific decision. But um, I was thinking of buying a King Air and, and I got to fly this DC-3 with Clay and we spent the day together and, and um, you know, we were flying his uh, his buddy Bert Rutan around. Um, and, you know, that's how I wound up sitting in a greasy spoon cafe in Lancaster, California with two aviation legends, um, you know, signing 
my signature in you know logbooks of people who would come by and, and try to get signatures from them. Um, yeah. And the um, you know it was sort of a, a surreal moment, and and Clay started to talk me into the idea of you know by owning a DC three is not as crazy as it seems, mm. and when you stand under one, it seems crazy. Yes. And um, but uh, you know. I've done some crazy things. So uh, yeah. I bit that off. And, and my, um, I, what I did was I took the idea to people who are responsible for keeping me from harm. Um, and I, I talked it over with my wife and, and she failed miserably. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I called my dad, uh, cause he, dad is one of the most practical people. I've had more, you know, conversations with dad, you know, from childhood onward, where he would say, you know, that's just a really dumb idea. Mm -hmm. um, and he, his reply was, kid, you only live once. That sounds like a ton of fun. Um, so I took it to my buddy, Eric, who uh, Eric and I were, were chiefs together at the airline. And, um, and Eric is one of the smartest people I know. And he's also one of the most practical. Um, and one of the things that I love about Eric is that he's never been afraid to tell me no. So I thought, well, this this is a really dumb idea. Eric will never sign off on this. And so I called Eric and said, you know, I'm, I think I'm thinking of buying a DC three. And Eric said, cool. Can I go to training with you? Uh, <laughs> so, so you're looking for someone to talk you out of it and just yeah, find it. And yeah. I'm surrounded by enablers. Um, <laughs> so I uh, I bought the airplane. It was a, just absolutely it was in horrific condition, but it had really good bones. And and I had I knew someone through air racing that was an expert in this sort of thing, and he helped select the airplane. And um, Clay Lacey was involved in helping us to find the airplane that we eventually restored, and and we did. Um, and marvelous machine. Um, I owned it for eleven years, <clears throat> flew it uh, all over the U.S. Um, and uh, through a good portion of Europe as well. And um, absolutely loved it. What started to happen was um, just kind of the, a, sort of a natural curve of life. Um, mm -hmm. but we reached a point where we weren't flying the airplane that much. And the, all of us that, that flew it, it, it takes a crew. I mean, it's yes, it's two pilots, but it, it takes a team to move this airplane around. And mm -hmm. um, we just we just all were sort of in a phase of life where it was hard to get our schedules to mesh. And, you know, we started out flying the thing 70, 80 hours a year, and then, then it dropped and then it dropped and then it dropped. And, and it, it reached a point where, um, you know, the, combined with the pandemic also that didn't help at all, but um, we were flying the airplane maybe 20 hours a year. Mm. And um, I started to have some real concerns that we were not able to maintain pilot proficiency um, to the degree necessary to safely operate the airplane. And, um, and that was a tough conversation to have with myself. Um, but, you know, Eric and I have been flying together for, for 20 plus years. Um, Eric has flown every airplane I've, I've owned. Eric has flown with me and, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, Eric and I, you know, well, you know, when I decided to fly the airplane to Europe for the 75th anniversary of D-Day, I called Eric to talk me out of it. And, you know, once again, he failed. Um, and, you know, we've operated the DC-3 over water and a bunch of things. And I, yeah. I found myself having conversations with the other crew members in which I was expressing concern about our proficiency. And, and that's not to say that we couldn't navigate the airplane from A to B. That wasn't what I was worried about. Mm. What I was worried about was uh, if we haven't flown the airplane in six weeks and we all pile in the airplane to go work on proficiency and we shell an engine or have a main bearing failure, leaving the runway on that first takeoff, yeah. that's going to be the fight of your life on a good day. Um, and if proficiency is lacking, that is really going to be a, a fight. Um, and yeah. I have promised myself and I've promised my mother um, that my last thoughts would not be, well, that was a bad idea. Um, yeah. And uh, I really started to grow concerned that we were having a hard time maintaining proficiency. So I, I sold the airplane uh, in June. Um, and, uh, you know, it, you want to watch a grown man cry. It was the first oh, time man. I have ever seen my own DC-3 fly was right. when it left. Uh, because from the day I bought it, the only time it flew, I was on it. So, yes, yeah. Um, and it was a it was a hard day. Um, my my wife, uh, you know, got a lover. She she brought martinis um, and she drove home. So yeah. um, it was a tough day, and I, I, I missed the airplane dearly. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was the right decision. 
Oh, sounds like such a very bold decision to take, but it's so much the right one. You know. Sometimes it's hard to be an adult. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, the romantic in me, um, I loved being the quirky guy that owned the DC3. Uh, we yeah. would, uh, the FBO where, uh, where our hangar is, you know, they manage the hangar and they would call me up on a routine basis. Like, hey, some Gulfstream just landed. They, they were flying overhead and they know the DC3 is here. They landed. Can they look at it? Mm. Um, and I loved that. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, the rampers called me one day like, hey, you know, Harrison Ford wants to look at your airplane. Is that OK? You know, like, <laughs> tell him. <no>. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, for a thing, fee. Yes, it like is. That. You know, it's, um, yeah. you know you, we flew the airplane um, to, you know, to Europe and we flew it around. Um, we took it over to see our, our, our friends at Aerosoft. I, I have a I have a a very close, very deep relationship with the team at Aerosoft. I, I think the world of them. And when we were going to, we brought the airplane all the way over there. We decided, you know, let's go the extra couple hundred miles. And, and we did. Um, they went to Paderborn, did you? Yes. Yeah, yeah we did. Yeah. Um, and, you know, air traffic controllers knew who we were. It was such an unusual experience. And I've, I've flown, you know, gosh, 80, some 80, 200 hours, I think in, in the logbook, something like that. Um, and I, you know, Air traffic controllers don't recognize you. They recognized us. Uh, you yeah. know, it's hard to walk away from that. Um, yeah. But I really thought I had a responsibility to the airplane, but above and beyond that, to the wives and children of the fellows that helped me fly the airplane. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I mean, you know, my, my buddy Paul, who is, you know, I, I met Paul through the airline industry and, and he's a, an extremely gifted mechanic and he helped maintain the airplane along with the, the, the specialist team that would fly into town to do it. And, you know, these are, these are guys that I'm, I'm very close to. Uh, I love them dearly. Mm. I have to be careful about putting someone at risk. Um, and so when I, when I, I found when I started losing sleep at night, the decision got easier. Um, yes. So, yeah. but, um, you know, but we, we all miss it. Oh, it's, yeah, you know, we, right. you know, we all do, we text, you know, we, you know, we're like a bunch of, you know, teenagers, you know, we just sit there and we all text we all miss yeah. it. We always will, but it was. The yeah. Right. But a happy 11 years or so with it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. That's amazing. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, there's a bit of received wisdom on the forums generally around the internet that you own your own 737 now. Is that, is that the case? <laughs> I've always thought it seemed a little unlikely, but I thought we'd ask. You know what? I'm, I'm done. We're out. <laughs> <laughs> so nice talking to you. <laughs> so that's a yes, though. <laughs> no, that's a yes. That's hilarious. No, I would love to know where that came from. I don't um, know. I don't know. It's just one of these things that does the rounds, you know. You know, you know, Robert. Yeah, he's got he's got a DC three and he's got a seven three seven in his hand. No, so, I have a seven forty seven. Let's start that, yeah. shall we? Um, yeah. yeah. No, I, I don't. I don't have a seven thirty seven. No. Okay. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> um, but um, the um, uh, no, I, I I do not. I I'm not type rated in the 737. I I don't have one. You know, and and honestly, you know, there's the big in the U.S. We've got the um, I don't know, the Powerball or whatever the lottery is that's tonight. You know, it's up to like you know 1.7 billion or something. Yeah. Uh, if I can convince my wife to to buy the winning ticket, um, yeah. yeah, 737 is actually probably the last airplane that I would buy. Yes, uh, on account of it being so, very dull in your own way. It, it is. It's such a dull airplane. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, you know, yeah. there's just nothing there. You know, to me, I, I'm I'm a romantic. Um, I, I mean, I, I really am. I, I mm. you know, I, I, it's it's a major weakness for me. I go out to an airport and I, I see an old airplane and I, you know, you imagine what the airplane looked like in its glory days and and yeah. how it was operated and and um, and I am just romantic enough that I'm gone and you know, you know, Rob's airplane rescue. Um, <laughs> you know, I have have rescued and restored a, a couple of different airplanes. Uh, okay. The um, you know, it's 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 what I do. It's. Mm. And it's an illness, but you know, if I saw a derelict 737 sitting on an airport, I, you know, no, no interest at all. It's just such a dull machine. Um, I'll tell you what I would, you know, if I, if I had limitless budget, 
Um, I would absolutely love to restore a 707, um, Ooh, but yeah. um, be hard to find engine cores to, to to run it. Plus, you've got you know noise issues because um, you know nobody likes that kind of racket flying through their neighborhood anymore. So, um, but uh, you know, but no, I. I I don't know. That's 737. Don't have one tucked away in your garage. No, okay. Oh, no, no. I like the idea though that, that 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 people would think that like you know that there's that level of um, you know crazy. I'm trying to remember where I first saw this now, and I honestly I honestly can't remember. It's you just hear about people talking about you and your GC3 and your 737, and I thought, yeah. nah, I'm sure yeah. not. Anyway, good. I'm pleased I was right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and the last, the sort of the last thing on you personally in your life, where did your interest in flight simulation come from? Um, well, I'm a nerd, uh, you know, and, and I think that uh, a lot of us in flight simulation, you know, we are, we're, we're all mm. nerds. Um, yeah. The, um, so I was, let me see here, 1980, it, it's sort of in the 81, 82 period of time. Um, I was growing up in, in Massachusetts and you know, all my friends knew I was, you know, aviation afflicted. Um, yeah. You know, that, that's sort of a, you know, if you knew me, you knew I was in love with aviation. And uh, one of my school buddies uh, lived up the road. Mm. His parents bought an Apple II and okay. he had um, Sublogic flight simulator on the Apple II. And it was the, 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 the 1.0, the one with the, you know, the old, the World War One arena that was like you know 10 squares by 10 squares with the 2d mountain range on two sides of it and mm -hmm. um and i was over his house to to play uh, castle wolfenstein oh yeah and, i remember that yeah and i saw this this floppy disk sitting in the and i you know said well you know what is this we, we need to play this mm. and so uh, we put that in and i was enthralled um you know this this idea that you could have a computer simulate an airplane was just like wow that was mind-blowing and so um so i um went home and begged and pleaded and begged and pleaded and tried to get my parents to buy me an apple II. um yeah. and my uh, my dad was afflicted with the like you always got to have the best you know the, the newest and latest so he bought me an apple three lisa um which it was funny this conversation came up in the team the other night and we were talking about it and um, the Apple III was sort of a brick with a green monitor sitting on top. And it uh, actually, it wasn't as useful as a brick. You could probably use a brick to break a window if you needed to. Um, uh -huh. yeah. It was a useless computer. But I tried really hard to get Flight Simulator to run on it. It wouldn't run and, you know, a bunch of other stuff. And then, you know, fast forward in, in high school, um, my uh, uh, my buddy Chris, who, uh, who also works for PMDG, um, he was he was the first true nerd that I ever really knew. Um, mm. And uh, Chris, if you're listening, yes. Um, the, <laughs> um, but, uh, but he had, he had built his own PC and he was the first person I'd ever met who'd done that. So, mm. um, so that turned that light on and, um, and, and, you know, Chris and I are literally, we, we built a friendship around trying to figure out how to get two PCs to talk to each other so that we could play Falcon. I think it was Falcon 1.0 or 2.0 um, mm -hmm. against each other in a dorm room um, in a, in a boarding school. And we eventually, you know, somebody introduced the idea of a null modem cable and off we went and we spent, you know, an hour chasing each other in a circle at like, you know, half a frame per second. Um, and, you know, it just was always kind of there. So, um, you know, my, when I was working for United Airlines in my spare time, I, you know, I would always waste all of my money. I mean, who needs to pay rent or eat? I would buy the latest hardware, you know, the, you know, the latest, you know, Pentium one point, whatever, um, yeah. to run, you know, what was, th what was then Microsoft flight simulator, you know, like, yeah. like, you know, 4.1, 4.5, that sort of thing. And, um, and I was, sort of accidentally involved in really the early bit twiddling that was going on um, in the early 90s, there was a, um, uh, there was a, a site um, that was hosted out of the University of Indiana. Um, there was a flight sim site that some, some engineering student or professor or somebody set up on their hardware and all of us flight sim nerds discovered it. Um, and you know, I found it in a book, in a bookstore um, and 
wound up there and you know people there were people yeah. were making tools and you know and, and we're talking about some of the names that that have people might not recognize anymore but you know guys like um you know enrico shirati and and um, oh, yeah. you know uh and and of course you know now that i want to rattle them all off i'm drawing a blank which you know that's a function of age um but there <laughs> were you know there were a whole bunch of those folks and you know, and, and i don't want to I don't want to say that I was playing at their level. I, I, I wasn't. I mean, these were some incredibly gifted nerds um, and incredibly good bit twiddlers, and they were making tools to do things. And right about that time, United Airlines uh, sent me out to Denver to help open. We There was a new airport that had just been built out there. Um, and we had this massive new terminal, and there were also a whole logistic uh, process involved in getting us moved from Stapleton to the new Denver International. And I got... Um, managed to talk my way onto that team. And um, and at some point, some fool gave me a suitcase that had um, what, you know, would we would all later learn was GPS, but it, but it was, I mean, it was like the size of a desk. Um, mm-hmm. And I had to, I spent a bunch of time with like four other guys wheeling this thing around the ramp and putting it on different parking spots to, and then writing down the you know, the coordinates that it spat out. Um, and so then I, you know, I kind of thought to myself, well, you know, this would be interesting. So, um, you know, we had free run of the place. There were no people there. Um, it wasn't open yet. So I dragged it around and I got the geographic coordinates of all the spires in the terminal. I uh, mean, you know, that the Elry Jefferson terminal is that circus tent of a thing. Yeah. Um, it was a big deal at the time. Like nobody had ever really done that on that scale. And so I got the GPS coordinates of all the circus spires and, um, and then managed to, to talk my way into a whole bunch of information, you know, some some uh, charting data from Jefferson on, you know, the layout of the airport on the 7. I went home and I made a DIA airport freeware um, yeah. and uploaded this to this this um, um, you know, to this site. Um, and and I, you know, and I don't know if this is entirely true, but I've always claimed that I was the first person to put runway centerline lights or sorry, taxiway centerline lights into scenery and the. The reason why I did it was, you know, I knew they were there, but the taxiways at DIA were so wide and the land was so flat that, you know, in Microsoft Flight Simulator, like four, whatever we were working with at the time, you literally couldn't see both ends of the taxiway if you mm-hmm. were, you know, in an airplane that, you know, was was of normal size. So, you know, I came up with right. that idea and it was, you know, it, it wasn't a great scenery, but it was kind of a project. And, and you know, and my twiddling sort of went from there and then... Um, and that was that was your first creation for any any flight simulator. It was, yeah, it was. Um, you know, and and it, um, you know, the stumbling from that into creating PMDG. You know, I I don't let anyone tell you that I was some sort of well thought out genius who you know came up with this great business plan. That just isn't true. It was an accident. Um, yeah. You know, it was it was what I did for fun. And and it's you know you people who hang out in the PMDG forum will see me actively promote um uh, other developers and and um you know uh, people making freeware and and you know we get people who reach out to us all the time you know hey i, I was thinking of you know making this little thing to interface with you know what pmdg does can i do that and and i'm always 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 try to support people doing that because that's where the innovation comes from in the sim community and yeah um, i mean that's that's where I came from and everybody else on the PMDG team, it's, it's where we came from. Um, Mm -hmm. Just this bit twiddling that goes on and occasionally someone has a really good idea. um, And, you know, all of the, you know, there's, there's like this, um, I'm going to call it mythology. Maybe it's the right word. Maybe it's not, but we are often in internal communication sort of surprised that people think PMDG is some like, you know, big monolithic corporation and, and, we're not. Um, I mean, you know, this is my office in the house. I, I, yeah. I'm just a, I'm just an average guy, and you know, sometimes I don't shave, and um, you know, I, I actually put shoes on today. Usually, I wear my slippers in the office, um, mm. but um, the, um, you know, I, we're we're pretty dull, we're pretty average, and we just like doing this. It's a lot of fun, um, and so you know, when people interact with our tech support or with us in the forum, you know, you're, you're talking to us. You're, you're, yeah. It's not some big corporation and you've got, you know, some, you know, think or some, you know, call bank in India that's, you know, that's answering calls or answering emails. You're actually talking to the people who do the work. 
Um, and I and sometimes I think people don't realize just how small all of this really is. And you still get that same excitement out of out of creating your aircraft these days that you got out of building that first airport or and those those first taxiway center line lines. Yes, um, really and I good. will even and I will even stop slandering the seven thirty seven for a moment and say that you know, <laughs> um, you know it's what what happens. <coughs> excuse me. Um, you know, the, the projects get boring. Um, mm. You know, if, if you were to poll internally at PMDG, they would universally tell you um, that they're so tired of the 737 because they've been working on it for a couple of years now. And, you know, you just, you get bored of yeah. working on the same stuff. And you um, would, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we're all... Um, you know, you know, guys that are that are working on the seven three are you know sort of eyeing the guys who've already transitioned to the you know the triple seven and you know yeah <laughs> we sort of have to keep the gates locked and <laughs> um, yeah. but um, you know the I was very bored with the seven three seven and was actually really against the what became the NGXU um, was originally going to be the NG3. This is before anyone had ever heard of, you know, the, the new Microsoft Flight Simulator. Yes, yes. Um, we were sort of living in this dying ecosystem of prepared. Mm. And we were going to redo the 737 to bring it up to the standard that we had reached with the 747. It was like every time we would come out with a product, we would sort of, you know, raise the, the standard a little bit. And then we would go back and we would, raise that up and then we'd, you know, raise this up and then we'd raise, and then, you know, we'd have to start over again. Yeah. And we really weren't planning on doing this again. We, we were already starting to look at the next airplane. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I was standing on a grass field in, in Duxford, a um, you know, little airport out near where you are, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, my phone blew up and it was, you know, they had just announced this new Microsoft flight simulator and, the first thing I thought was, well, this is really cool. And the second thing I thought was, crap, we're going to have to do that damn 737 over again. Um, but, um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah. but, you know, when we got the 73 into Microsoft Flight Center, actually, that's not entirely true. We, the first thing we did was the DC-6. And when we got the DC-6 into Microsoft Flight Simulator, that was to me, a very similar experience to each of the major evolutionary cycles of flight sim, like, you know, the first one. And then, you know, when it became, you know, when it became color, that was a big deal. Um, and then, you know, when it had you know, 3D acceleration and there were color gradients and, and things, that was a big deal. Yeah. And this was a absolute generational quantum leap forward and and being able to see the dc6 and how beautiful it became compared to prepared yeah and then when we got the 737 in there it was the same thing and um the uh the triple seven yeah wow um and i'm, I'm really looking forward to um uh, vin if you're listening hurry up and finish because you know everybody's favorites is the seven four? Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. The, when when the seven four is done, that is going to be probably as close as I get to a religious experience. So yeah, uh, oh, really, I think I I'm can't imagine forward. anyone is looking forward to any aircraft more than the seven four. <laughs> there will be a few. There'll be a few who think the A three eighty is the pinnacle of aircraft development, but they're wrong and can be ignored. The seven four is where it's at. Well, so you and I are clearly <laughs> on the same page. I, yeah. I, yeah. It's a, yeah, the, it's a uh, you know, the, the triple seven is an absolutely magnificent machine. And I, yes. um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, a we've already established I'm a nerd. Um, yeah. you know, when I'm sitting here in the office working, um, <clears throat> there's, I've got a TV on the far wall in the office and, and I'll pull up YouTube and there's a couple of streamers, um, out of, uh, you know, there's, there was one I had on, you know, this morning while I was working at about four in the morning. Um, this fellow in Birmingham who was, you know, live streaming. And I like to watch that because it's, you know, I don't know what goes on at that airport, but, you know, it's always sort of entertaining to watch, you know, guys try to get an airplane onto a runway in Birmingham. Um, and the, but my favorite is there's a, a fellow that streams out of LAX. Mm. And um, so, uh, you know, since, you know, Paul, uh, who I mentioned works at LAX, I am still trying to convince him to drive through the camera frame, you know, in his, his uh, maintenance vehicle, <laughs> making gestures out the window um yes. he won't do it um, Why? But, um 
the um, it's something about not wanting to lose his job or something. Yeah, professionalism you know, and all that nonsense. He's picky that way. Yeah. But um, the um, but I you know I'll have the stream on in the yeah. in the background and um, you know so the, it, it's uh, and I've to- completely lost track of what I was about to tell you. But um, you know I'll have the stream on in the background and that sort of thing and, and we'll see or you know, we uh, you know I'll see you know like the triple seven three hundred on there. Um, right now and I'll be you know looking at what I'm looking at on the screen and looking at that and looking at the you know and, and it's yeah. it's exciting um yeah. I can't wait to get you guys um the the, the triple um it, nice. it's just such a fun airplane it, it's so capable and um and it's not a 737 yeah <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely it can go yeah. it can go further and uh, yeah yeah it is a beautiful plane it's no 74 but it is a, a beautiful yeah. plane I'm yeah. just gonna say thank you for all your questions, do keep them coming. I will ask them at uh, an appropriate time. Um, I should say that Steve, in in reference to your uh, comment about everyone being bored of the 737, says that he's hard at work testing it, uh, the 900 rocketing out of Dallas Fort Worth on his way to Atlanta, so he's not bored. Um, <laughs> and uh, lots of excitement in the chat for both the 74 and the 777, which we yes. will be talking about, obviously, good. Uh, good, good. later on. Um, but just going back to the early days of PMDG very quickly, um, you started off by developing manuals for flights in aircraft. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. where did that idea come from? And uh, what prompted you to pursue it? Lack of other appreciable marketable skills. Um, <laughs> right. The um, So uh, uh, a fellow by the name of Hardy Hyland, a uh, very gifted programmer, um, aviation nut, um, you know, uh, you know he, another fellow nerd, um, he came up with uh, a program, um, uh, PS1, which was a, a, a sort of a DOS-based 2D 747-400 simulator. And um, yeah, at the time, I was in uh, management at United Airlines. We had, um, I think at the time, we were the world's largest operator of 400s. Um, it we might have been number two behind BA, but we, you know, we would sort of swap positions there. Um, yeah. But, um, but so we had, you know, the Sims out in Denver and I had been out there and played in them and you know, a bunch of other stuff. And, and so um, on the Internet, um, so, which was <laughs> for a lot of people was still kind of a new thing, not not for us, you know, Sim nerds. Yeah. Um, people were starting to talk about this PS1 and I, you know, placed my order and it was not an inexpensive piece of software. I mean, I, I think it was like one hundred and seventy dollars back in ninety seven um, mm-hmm. and it showed up. And, um, it had a, it had a, a, you know, a little spiral bound manual that sort of, you know, got you through the basics, but there were no procedures. There was no, um, you know, here's how the airplane is operated in, in, in anger. Um, and so I, you know, I sat with it. I mean, the first weekend I had it, I, I don't think I slept. I, you know, I sat there trying to figure out how to, you know, there were all these preloaded scenarios so you could fly it, but yeah that's no fun. I want to learn how to yeah. start. So, um, you know, you load the, the cold and dark scenario and try to figure out how to start the thing. And, and I don't think any of us ever made that work. And so, um, so I reached out to a friend of mine who had, um, he was one of the um, uh, original training captains on the airplane at United. Yeah. And um, he said, Oh, you know, I, I've got all the books for that, you know, in the basement someplace. Um, so I, made a trip out there to see him and, you know, we traipsed around underneath the house with the the cobwebs and the rats and we found the, the books and he was like, here, you know, you can, you can have those. And I actually have one of them here. Um, and so he gave me this, um, which, you know, is, it's, um, you know, pretty, pretty basic stuff. It's, it's not, you know, all that exciting. Um, but it was, it was the training manual. And so I took that, um, and used it to build out an educational manual for the 74 to help my other fellow sim nerds. Um, and it, and I really was doing it just kind of as a, you know, it was just something to do. Um, and, um, someone offered to buy it from me and I, I thought, well, you know, I, I can't sell it to you. I made it myself. I mean, you know, yeah. ridiculous. But then after a couple of those offers came in, because I was sort of telling people, you know, what I was doing. Um, so I decided, well, you know, okay, whatever. So, um, you know, called a, a, a friend of mine who's knew a little bit about business and they recommended starting a corporation. So I didn't take that advice. Um, but, um, 
I put it up for sale on the internet. And then next thing I knew, I had um, a couple of different vendors reach out to me. They wanted to sell it, you know, for me. Um, and so I hadn't really thought the thing through. Um, and, and I was running down to the the local, you know, print shop and, you know, printing out, you know, 50 copies of each page um, and having the little binder, the separators printed and buying all the three ring binders. And then, you know, me and, and, um, uh, the, the girlfriend I had at the time were sitting on the kitchen floor in my tiny little apartment, assembling them um, for days at a time. It was a really bad plan. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, I think I thought I would sell like 10 of them. Um, and I think in the end, it was somewhere around 12, 1400 copies went out the door. Um, and that paid for my instrument training. Um, and it also paid for my, for my multi-engine rating. And, um, in, in, um, you know, in, in 1997, um, might've been 97, might've been early 98. I, I went to visit, uh, you know, my, my buddy, Chris, who, who I've mentioned before. And, um, he said one of the funniest things he's ever said to me, we were driving around and I was talking about how, you know, I'd, I'd made, you know, I made like, you know, this much money and it was pretty exciting. And he said, well, he said, you know, look at the bright side. You've made more money than amazon.com, um, which at the time was true. So, wow. yeah. you, know, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, and it just kind of, and, and that was, that was that, but it's, you know, that's a, it's a tough thing to do. And, and I then started to make um, flight models for other freeware products. Um, so I started making really detailed flight models for the 707 in micro in flight simulator for some freeware models that were out there. And, and, you know, one thing okay. led to another, led to another, and it just kind of kept, it just kept growing. Um, so improvements to freeware aircraft to, to make the flight. Yeah. By the ribbon. yeah. Okay. Which goes back to what I said about, you know, you know, I mean, you know, people, they get interested and they've got some skills and they start to twiddle. And next thing you know, you, you've got something. Yeah. Um, and people that sit where I sit now, I think we have a responsibility to promote that and to, and to help it grow. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when we were in conversations with Dovetail 10 years ago, gosh, has it been that long? Probably eight years Sounds ago. About right. Um, about they, you know, they were going to make, um, their, they were buying the source code to FSX and they were going to create, you know, this new simulator. Um, and it became obvious right away that they were going to make a walled garden of it, that you were not going to be able to do anything unless you were licensed to sell through their store. And, mm. and I, I really was frustrated by that. And I was frustrated, you know, yes, it would affect PMBG. It would drive up our costs, but you know, yeah. we're a business. We would simply adjust the pricing to, you know, to, to reflect the costs and life goes on, yes. but it would kill the freeware market. Um, Yes. And it would wipe out that entire basis of innovation. And, you know, as someone who has, you know, and, and I don't mean this to sound arrogant or egotistical, but, you know, I feel like I have some responsibility to try to promote the community. I mean, that's where I came from. It's where all of us came from. Yeah. And it's and, what, what the future of the of flight simming relies upon, really, isn't it? It's people yeah, starting out, tinkering it, with, with airports and doing little bits here and there. And yeah. yeah. Um, and so I very publicly, um, I very publicly tried to shame them uh, when it became obvious that what they were up to. Um, and, you know, fast forward a bunch of years. And the, yeah. The first, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the first time... Um, the first time I got to speak to uh, to Jorg Newman at Microsoft, um, you know, I, I was worried. I, I really was, and I and I was worried not because you know they were going to say, well, you know, everybody. You know, I, I was worried it was going to be the same thing. And and I, um, you know, I the, you know, our team recalls that you know that first conversation with Jorg, the most important thing I wanted to learn was, is, will this be walled off? Will the freeware community? persist. Um, and, and Jorg and, and his team made it clear right from the, I mean, the, probably the first sentence of that conversation that, um, that they understand the, the value of the freeware market and, and that developer interaction and that, how that benefits the community and, and causes the entire ecosystem to grow. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you, I mean, a lot of folks probably weren't paying as much attention to it as, as we were, but, um, you know, we all learned about the the impending arrival of Microsoft Flight Simulator in June of 19, and in August of 19, um, 
I announced that that we were four square behind it, that that we were going to convert over to that, and that would be our primary platform. Yeah, nobody had even seen it yet. Yeah, uh, but I I made that statement based on those conversations, and and um, Jorg and his team, um, you know, I, I think people are always trying to create some daylight between you know PMDG and, and Microsoft, and oh they don't get along. <laughs> You know, all yeah. That. yeah. You know, we. Um, you know, do we always love each other? Yeah, no. Um, but I don't think we should. Um, no. But you know, I have so much admiration, so much respect for what they are doing and how they are going about it. Um, and yeah. you know, uh, the the biggest frustration that I have with Microsoft Light Simulator is that we have had a really hard time learning everything there is to learn. Um, and that's not on them. That's that's you know that's that's us. It's um, it's hard. It's hard to learn new tricks and, and and trying to you know leverage all the new stuff. And you know, yeah. and we thought we would have our products in the Microsoft Marketplace back in, um, you know, we thought we would have the seven three seven seven hundred back in in Marketplace probably by the middle of July. Mm. Um, and we're still. <laughs> Still trying. <laughs> this was so. something that that was asked actually that I was going to come on to later. Um, the challenges of keeping up with new flight simulators because I believe your earliest products, the seven five and seven six, were for fly, weren't they? Was that, yes. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. And and so you've moved from there to Microsoft Flight Simulator and through the various iterations up to FS twenty twenty, yes. um, which must have presented some challenges. And I wanted to know. Um, how you kept up with the pace of development, how you kept up with the changes that were going on within the MSFS franchise, and how that compares with what you're doing now, which is dealing with sim updates and world updates and having to continuously um, uh, update your, your aircraft more than I, I guess you ever would have done with FSX. So, so it was a lot easier back then um, because the platforms were effectively dead. Um, mm -hmm. It was it was release and walk, um, yeah. you know. So, um, you know, we're talking about the you know, early mid '90s through you know, really 2006. Um, you know, uh, Sublogic, uh, you know, Microsoft mm -hmm. would publish, and that was it. it you you might see one update um, mm -hmm. with some bug fixes, but for the most part, what you got was what you got. Yeah, <clears throat> and that made it pretty easy in retrospect. Um, I, you know, I don't think we necessarily saw it that way at the time um, no. because we were always sort of, you know, well, why can't they fix this? You know, they just need to fix this. Um, yeah. And in retrospect, that level of static stability um, in the, the, the platform allowed us to get pretty good at what we did. Um, the, um, for, a, for a brief period of time, Microsoft walking away after FSX and kind of leaving the market alone really gave us um, what we thought was, you know, for a while, the, sort of the golden age of, of flight simulation, because we didn't have to keep rewriting everything to make it work on the new platform. We could just make it really good on that platform and get really good at manipulating the platform yeah. to do what we wanted it to do. Yeah. And, um, you know, prepared came along. Um, that was not a difficult transition at first. It was very easy, but then the two started to diverge. And then it started to get much more complicated. Um, in retrospect, that turned out to be a good training regimen for what we're doing now. And and what we're doing now is massively complicated. Yeah. Um, we have a platform that is under continual development, which is a great thing um, because it's constantly... Um, now, when I say this, the, the cynics in the room are going to laugh, so brace yourself. But it's constantly improving and getting better. Um, and the cynics in the room are like, oh, they break stuff every time there's a release. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, welcome to welcome to software. Um, Those things can be true, I think. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. And, you know, hey, I, you know, I fly, um, I, you know, I fly a very complex airplane that has a whole bunch of electronic systems in it. And, you know, about every year there's a software update for it. And every year they break something. So it happens in the real world, too. Um, yeah. But, you know, we... Um, we got very comfortable with prepared and yeah. we're not comfortable with Microsoft Flight Simulator. And, you know, there are, there are things that the folks at Asobo have done to make our lives easier, which have made their lives more complicated. And I think people lose 
that perspective that, um, you know, for example, we work in C++, which is a, which is a, a really, really good engineering language. Our simulations are massively complex, and yeah. we need that level of engineering complexity. And we can't do a lot of the things that we do in a script-based language, which um, the original SDK for Microsoft Flight Simulator is based upon. So when Asobo recognized that, they, I mean, I it it pains me to think of the amount of work that went into unlocking their SIM so that we could bring C++ products. You know, and I say we, it wasn't just us. It was most of the, the, the existing third-party ecosystem yeah. so that we could all bring our products in without having to completely re-script them. I mean, the, you know, the 737, um, you know, somebody did a line count on it, and I, I think it was like 1.7 million lines of code. Um, you know, it would not be an insignificant challenge, um, and there are parts of it that you can't do of what we do, there's there's parts that you can't do in script language. So there's there, there's complexities there, um, and so they are constantly trying to drive the you know the, the markers further out so that we can get further out. Um, but they're also trying to they're trying to fix things and they're trying yeah. to add new features and they're trying to add you know, um, you know DLC and they're trying to add adventures and they're yeah. you know, yeah. they've got a lot of things that they're trying to accomplish and so um, you know when we asked for uh, just last night I, I asked for something just last night um, and uh, you know I I'm not happy with the um, with the modeling of um, uh, tire friction and. You know, we had a whole physics-based model that we developed um, that we used and prepared, and it doesn't work well in Microsoft Flight Simulator, and, and there's a lot of technical reasons that I'm not going to go into because they're boring. But um, so we have been converting our airplanes over to use the default Asobo layer, which actually works quite well. But there's a couple things that aren't quite dialed in right. And so, you know, yeah. just last night I was asking for one of them. And, you know... Um, there are, the, there are two questions that I feel could slot in really nicely here. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go the ahead. first one is about uh, is about the difference in um, braking between the NG3 and the NGXU, which I suspect might have something to do with this this physics model. Um, Simon was asking about it. He said that you know the, the, the auto brake level three in P3D is is a lot more effective, say, than auto brake level three in MSFS. And is that which is more realistic, and and why is that? Um, there are, there's a number of factors driving it. And this goes back yeah. to, you know, this goes back to tire friction. Um, yeah. there are things that I can control in prepared that we don't get to control in, uh, in Microsoft Flight Simulator. And so we have to go back to, um, trying to leverage what we know the SIM does versus what we know that it doesn't do in order to get the outcome that we want. And, and, um, it, it is extremely difficult. Um, and part of why it's difficult is that we don't have a debugging tool that allows us to see in real time what's going on inside the the mathematics. Um, okay. And uh, you know, and you're going to hear this a lot. And I and I when I say this, um, my my protagonists, uh, my antagonists, critics, my critics will say, <laughs> yeah, um, oh, he's blaming a solo, and I'm not. Um, you know, I. I I'm not in the game of, of blaming a Sobo. I, you know, I, I live in a world of, of reality. Um, and the reality is that we don't have a debugger that allows us to see the, what the engineering code is doing at any particular moment in the sim. And so we have had to create tools and these tools are very similar to the tools we used in 1992 to data dump stuff out of Microsoft flight simulator four point, you know, whatever oh, what it was doing. Yeah. Um, they're primitive. I mean, we, we joke about the fact that we are, um, you know, Cro-Magnon debuggers. Um, I mean, literally, we're, our knuckles are dragging on the floor again, and it's frustrating. <laughs> and, and yeah. you know, and Sobo knows that. They, you know, they are working toward it. You know, it is one of a thousand priorities that they have. And, you know, one day they'll, you know, one day they, they will, I hope, soon, um, you know, they'll they'll hit me up on on our private channel and say, you know, hey, we're, we're pushing something, try this. Um, you know, there have been some incremental improvements, um, but they're not, you know, they're not nearly enough to get us to where we need to be. In, mm -hmm. in prepared, I can go and, and um, I can run a D-cell um, in auto break three in prepared and I can, 
I can see in real time exactly what the energy levels are, what the the, uh, the thermal transfer rates are, what the absorption levels are, you know, what loss of friction there is from a change in, um, you know, going from concrete to asphalt to, you know, to wet pavement. I can see all of that in real time. Right. Um, I can also, you know, put it into a graph on the screen in, in real time and, and see what those things are doing so that I can tinker and adjust so that it will match what the engineering guides tell us the airplane should be doing at that particular moment. Okay. In Microsoft Flight Simulator, I have to, um, I had to create a, uh, an algorithm to measure where did the brake apply start and where did it stop? What's the distance between them? And then I have to try to interpret what that tells me. Um, so, you know, and so all of these variables that play into it, you know, such as, you know, thermal transfer on the brakes and, uh, you know, entire friction and, and the surface type and whether it's contaminated or not, I have to impute what might be going on because I can't see into the sim and the sim can't tell me what it's seeing. Mm. Um, you know, we've, you know, another sort of related example is, you know, we had something as simple as a switch that wasn't working in the 737 cockpit. Um, in prepared, it would take, you know, me, and I'm probably the least skilled programmer on the team. It would take me 90 seconds, um, including loading the, the debugger and loading the sim yeah. to, to see it and figure out what it's doing and then adjust the code to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, in Microsoft Flight Simulator, it took us, that, that switch took... Um, for developers, almost a day and a half because we had to develop tools to get data out of the sim so we could see what was going on with the mouse click transfer and whether that was making it to the sim and then, you know, whether the sim was interpreting it correctly, whether it was applying it to the correct switch, whether the switch was seeing it as, a, you know, go left or right. And, and we have to create all these tools to see all these things because we can't just see them in the sim. Um, so. Right. Right. So, you know, anyway, it's that um, is really interesting. I, I didn't know there was that vast gulf between what prepared allowed you to do and what MSFS allowed you to do still. Um, I've got two questions related to the technical side of development that I that I don't really understand, but I think they'd slot in quite nicely here. Um, I probably don't either. So that'll make two of us. <laughs> uh, the first one is, uh, does PMDG still face a limited C++ development environment in MSFS? If yes, does there continue to be a dependence on prepared for some development tasks? And does this extend the development cycle? If I think one of my teammates is in there feeding you questions. Um, <laughs> so the, um, yeah, the, the answer is uh, yes, it is still a limited environment. Um, you know, we were having this conversation last night um, with um, you know, one of the challenges we face one of the bigger challenges that we face right now is uh, you know we've been wrestling with um, getting our the our tablet into the 737 to work the way we want it to work mm -hmm. and one of the reasons why this is so difficult is um, you know I, I mentioned already that the 737 is built on an engineering software language c++ yeah and somewhere along the way um there was a decision made in the development of Microsoft Flight Simulator to decapitate um, all the communication capabilities of C++ from the SDK. So in prepared, we can communicate with the machine that the simulation is running on in order to access other programs in memory, in order to transfer data back and forth between other programs, um, in order to reach, you know, things that are off in the, you know, in the universe. So, um, you know, our, our global flight operations, for example, which was being designed for prepared, um, currently can't work in Microsoft Flight Simulator because we need to be able to communicate with the outside world. And a C++ airplane is, it can only see inside the Microsoft Flight Simulator box. It can't see anything else and it can't communicate with any other airplanes or products operating in the Microsoft Flight Simulator box. If we were to build a, an entirely script-based airplane, um, which most of the default airplanes are, um, those have the ability to communicate with other products in the sim and, out, and the outside world. Okay. We've asked the question of Asobo many times, why the difference? Yeah. Um, and we've not gotten a direct answer. Um, and, I, and I don't think there's anything nefarious to that. 
I think that there were some decisions um, made that probably, you know, and this is this this is just you know, Rob guessing. This is not you know of an, an official position of PMBG. Mm-hmm. Um, if I were to make a decision to do that, it would probably be for security reasons. There is a reason this decision was not made accidentally, um, and it's probably security. And so, um, a Sobo is taking baby steps to unlock pieces of that, um, and we have seen pieces of it unlock. But there's still some limitations. I mean, for example, we can't, you know, okay, again, we're going to go into nerd territory here, but, you know, we can't hit, um, we can't get data on the local machine. So, you know, we can't bounce an HTTP request between the tablet and the airplane to transfer text data back and forth. Right. So what we've had to do is, so we've got a, the, the tablet is written in script, so it can communicate with the outside world to get Navigraph charts and SimBrief and all that other stuff. The airplane is in C++ and it is just absolutely blind. It can't talk to anybody. But right. inside of Microsoft Flight Simulator, we have the ability to communicate through, um, well, they're, they're called LVARs. And so we can run data back and forth between the two. The problem is that we can only run data back and forth in whole numbers. We can't use floating point, which is decimals, and we can't use text. Well, look at your average flight plan, and most of it is decimals and text. Yeah, so, yeah. so suddenly we have this limitation. And so right. how do you get around it? Well, this is where the smarter guys in the room, and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm talking about you know, guys like, like Chris and, and Alex and, and, uh, and, and Dr. Vows. You know, these guys have spent months developing a communication protocol, which is, you know, unique to this environment um, to allow data to go back and forth. And it has not gone that smoothly. Um, And so, you know, we, you know, have, have asked uh, Sobo a couple of times, like, Hey, you know, can, can you open this up so we can see it? Um, And Sobo is, you know, justifiably very protective of their platform. They need to be, and they should be. um, So they are looking at it and they're, but they're taking their time and doing it. Um, But, you know, so we're running into limitations like that. Um, And it's, um, you know, and again, you know, there's, there's a whole group of people out there who want to put all kinds of daylight between, you know, PMBG and Sobo. And, and I, and, and, and that's, it's not true and it's not helpful. It's not the case. No, no, there's no. there's a lot of very cooperative discussion that goes mm-hmm. on. And but you wouldn't be where the planes wouldn't be where they are today if, if there wasn't, I, I guess. Yeah. Um, and you know, and oftentimes when we ask them questions, you know, we you know, just this week we we brought this one up again. And you know, and the, the question comes back to us is we know, can you explain the use case for us? And so, you know, we then we go through that conversation mm-hmm. because you know, we're asking them to like, hey, you know, can you can you change this over here? And they don't know why we want to, uh, and they need to they need to know, so they yeah. need to understand it. And so, you know, this conversation has been going on for you know eighteen, 20, actually, eh, twenty four months now. So, um, you know, we'll get there. Um, yeah. You know, so there's yes, there are differences. Um, okay. And, okay. So leading on from that, if PMDG was to develop a new aircraft from scratch with no legacy code from previous sim versions. Would this prompt a switch to Wasm, JavaScript, etc., as core languages? Uh, it's too early to answer that question. Um, okay. I am gonna, but you know, when um, we've had this conversation internally, and and my feeling about it is um, probably not um, for two reasons. One, I suspect that for, um, I suspect that a lot of the problems that are, sna- that are a lot of the snags that we're hitting right now will have engineered our way through them or they'll have been resolved by the time we get to that. So, you know, plus our internal expertise is um, to develop airplanes at an engineering level that really requires C++. Mm-hmm. Um, if we were to back up to a script-based airplane, um, w- we'd have to shed a- an awful lot of complexity which, um, you know, and, and the problem there isn't a matter of like, oh, you know, we're going to dumb it down. You know, that, that's not what that means. Um, what it means is that we'd have to change the way we manage a whole lot of very complex engineer, a whole lot of very complex engineering. We would have to engineer new ways to do it. It would wind up taking longer. Um, right. So, right. you know, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, there's no, there's no perfect answer. No. Uh, or, you know, how do you want to, you know, where do you want to develop your airplane? Um, 
it's you know like everything else it's a it's a series of um you know it, it's it's a series of concurrences that, and you sort of have to decide this is going to work best for us so yes uh, yeah okay fair enough fair enough um so i think we've moved squarely onto msfs development um now really uh so i'm going to ask you a few of the questions that people have asked in the discord and also some of the ones that people are asking now uh, on the chat um Starting with, what's your favorite part about developing an aircraft? Um, so I'm a systems nerd. Um, <clears throat> I like to know why the airplane does what it does. Yeah. Um, to me, it's not sufficient to say that, you know, I, I turn, you know, this hydraulic switch on and there's hydraulic pressure. Um, mm -hmm. I am, uh, you know, and, and uh, Paul is probably laughing because um, I spend, you know, poor Paul, you know, he, he gets phone calls from me and it's, you know, explain to me how this particular signal amplifier works. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, he and I have had some hilarious conversations um, where, you know, my, my, my wife and I were, we're relatively boring and, and, in the evening, um, you know, I, I sit up here and, you know, I, I, I do this because I enjoy it. So instead of like, you know, having an actual hobby, I will sit here and work on stuff. And so yes. my wife has a, has a, a desk up here and she'll sit here and do her work. Um, and the two of us will chat. Um, but she has laughed at the level of granularity uh, of questions that I'll get into with Paul and, you know, and, and she'll tease me and say, you know, you'd think the two of you were trying to land on the moon. Um, and, you know, we will get into, um, you know, the fact that the, you know, the switch that we're using to turn that hydraulic pump on, it has, it has a five volt source. It has a 28 volt source. It has a 12 volt source. What are all those things doing? Which relay is it triggering? What impact is that having on the pump? How long does it take that pump to, you know, to get the signal to spool up? Where is the sensor? that's mm -hmm. telling you what the output of that pump is. What should that sensor be seeing? How is that sensor powered? Um, what is its primary source of power? What's its secondary source of power? And then, you know, and we will just keep running those wires all the way out. Um, the, our, um, our airplanes, you know, and, and this is, you know, because <laughs> this is what I do for entertainment, um, are incredible studies in the complexity of um, modern aviation and its and its redundancy. So, mm. um, you know, in in our seven thirty seven, when you throw a switch, um, we're not just simply saying, okay, well, he turned that switch on, so turn that thing on. We are literally running the electrical circuit on whichever you know voltage circuit it is. We're closing the circuit, and now you know downstream. You know, whichever you know, valve, switch, relay, whatever it is that's on the other end of it gets the signal that you now have power, and it does its thing, whether it's open or closed. Um, <clears throat> and so we get this wonderful level of complexity. I, I mean, you know, something that most people probably don't know is that when you turn off the in the seven three seven, you know, if you picture the seven three seven, your hydraulic, your engine hydraulics or your your uh, hydraulic panels are here, and the engine hydraulic switches are the two on the outside. When you turn that switch off, people think, oh, I'm turning off the pump. You're not. What you're doing is you're taking power away from a relay, which then closes. And that when that relay, excuse me, that relay opens. And when that relay opens, it is closing the fluid flow to the pump. I um, see. Okay. And so you then, you know, you then see the pressure light come on because you've lost pressure downstream from that pump. But that pump's still rotating. Um, yeah. And that pump is still generating heat and that pump is still doing all the things that it should do. And there's going to come a point where that pump is going to say, all right, well, you know, I use that fluid for lubrication. And since you've closed that solenoid and I no longer have, you know, fluid flow for lubrication, I'm just going to melt down. Um, right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and all of that is simulated. And, and yeah. so, you know, and, and all and that happens you know, it's not like, you know, we set out to like, okay, how can we, how can we melt this pump down and really ruin the user's day? Um, it happens because we, we track all these things and we've engineered them into um, the, the airplane. And so you know, your question was, what do I like most about it? I like that. Um, yeah. 
And you know, one of our one of our favorite um, sadist pastimes, uh, Paul and I will, you know, when uh, he he works for a major airline, and and we um, uh, we went to their sim center to to do some things, and um, Paul loves to sit in the back of the the airplane, the back of the sim while I fly, and he just sits there, and you hear him giggle, um, and it's an insinuous giggle, and then you'll hear a click from a button that he's pushing. And then yeah. something will go wrong. And, um, you know, I, um, you know, not because it's true, but just because it's fun to torment him. I, always, I like to brag to Paul about, you know, how I'm, I'm invincible as a pilot. And Paul <laughs> will sit there in the back of the sim and say, okay, all right, let's see how this is going to go. And and we um, we had a 7-4 sim, um, you know, took off out of San Francisco, went out over the water. And because, you know, Paul had to pay me back for something I had said to him at some point, you know, we had to dump fuel and come back to San Francisco. And, you know, we wound up limping this airplane back in there. And uh, I mean, it was, you know, manual everything um, and got it to a stop on, on uh, one zero left and literally couldn't see the end of the runway under the nose of the airplane. Um, and I turned around and said something obscene to him. And so he said, you want to try it again? Um, and, you know, and this is what we do because he wants to see if I know the airplane well enough to keep flying it when he breaks everything except the wings bar. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is, this is what we do for fun. Now, yeah. when we flew DC three across the Atlantic, it, you know, Paul said to me very seriously, I would appreciate it if you not break the airplane for me while we're flying. Um, so, you know, <laughs> yeah, apparently doesn't yeah. have a lot of confidence in his ability to swim. So, you know. <laughs> ah, fantastic. So it's, so it's really, it's really the nitty gritty of why things happen and how they work and, and, how you replicate that that's that's what's yeah yeah I, had, I mean we we probably have two and a half million pages of engineering documents um mm. in our you know it, it, that we use to to build these things it's um you know it, there is a a level of complexity in our products that i think most people really don't understand um which is fine but what i what i think happened what i hope happens is that when you use our products when you you know, when you flip a switch and there's a, you know, there's a slight lag in that light coming on, or there's a slight lag in the light turning off, or, you know, you're flying along and, you know, you see a light flicker and go out and you kind of wonder like, oh, what was that all about? You know, what we want people to get used to is that this is what the airplane does. This is yeah. how it looks to the flight crew. Um, you know, the, the 777 has logic to suppress messages um, so that transient states don't keep lighting up the ICAST panel. We've got all that modeled. Um, mm -hmm. And the, you know, the, the sharp um, pilot, so remember this for, you know, all the, when the 777 comes out, um, you know, the 777, if you have, if you're light on fuel in the center wing tank and, and the airplane is at a high deck angle, you're going to unport the, the, the pumps in, in the, the center fuel tank. And you might start to see the fuel pressure lights flicker, but you won't get an ICAST message. And then, you know, the logic for when the airplane pitches over, there's all kinds of things about deck angle that, that change the way that logic is controlled to suppress those messages. All of that's modeled. So, yeah. you know, you might be sitting there and be looking at the overhead in your VR, you know, and, and say, oh, wait, that flash would, you know, why did that flash? And you'll look at the ICAST, there's no message. That's why it's, it's yeah. all modeled. Um, and I just, you know, I, I nerd out on that stuff. It's, it's what makes it fun. Yeah. I get that. I get that. Absolutely. Um, bit of a segue here, a bit of a segue from the 737 to the DC six. Um, is there any news on it getting any improvements, fixes or new features? Um, well, I'm not sure exactly what, you know, what we would, um, add to it. Um, the, That's all um, I've got. <laughs> what's that? That's all I've got. I'm afraid I don't fly it myself. Yeah. So we thing. are, you know, we are in the process of expanding the number of GPS options um, that the pilot can have, uh, and um, you know, and, and that's sort of fun um, because you know, in the the DC three, we had a Garmin 750, which I loved. Um, marvelously intuitive device, so much easier to use than you know than a VOR. Um, and so we are working with um, uh, we're working with a vendor to slot their Garmin 650 into the DC6. It, you know, it goes up here, um, and we are um, working. We've we've had a wonderful running conversation with the folks at Working Title to make sure that the airplane gets their their new iteration of the the Garmin 430 to slot right in there, um, and. 
we are, you know, what, as we are, and this is true for, for all of our products. And, and even when we get to the triple and we get to the seven, four, this, this will continue to be true. We are sort of on this constant education journey um, where, you know, we are learning through our conversations with the Sobo and with other developers and, you know, in our own reading and exploration, how to do things a little bit better um, in various corners of the sim. So yeah. as we figure those things out, then, you know, we go, we start populating them back through the other airplanes. So, um, so we're spending time, you know, we're working on uh, the, the flight stability on the DC six. We're working on the, you know, the, well, you know, the, the tire friction is, you know, again, it's, yeah. that's my area of development. It's, it's my source of constant frustration. Yeah. Um, you know, so things like that will all, you know, it's, it's sort of a constant upgrade cycle. We it's, it's hilarious. Um, one of the things that we, that we joke about internally, if you release the perfect product and it has no bugs and it needs nothing else, um, you will get a, burned at the stake because, well, you've abandoned the product because you're not pushing any updates. Mm. Okay. If you release an absolutely incomplete bug riddled piece of garbage and you're updating it every week, you'll get burned at the stake because you released a bug riddled piece of garbage and mm. you, you, you know, and you're updating it. Yes. <laughs> what do you want to um, so, yeah. So the DC six is, um, uh, I, I love the DC six. The DC six is my favorite product, um, yeah. of our staple right now. I fly it all the time. Um, I'm a vintage airplane nut. I love working with radial engines. I always have. Um, I think it is absolutely a, um, an, a, a high fidelity representation of what it's like to fly a classic airliner. And I have a lot of experience doing that. Um, so I love it. And I don't think it needs a whole lot. Um, okay. And... I've got some specific examples that are coming in as we speak. Go ahead. Um, Paul would like to know if there will be different power settings at cruise with the flight engine. Um, something that I think a few people were hoping for. Well, power settings are entirely manual, so um, you can set them however you like. Okay. That's not something that the flight engineer gets involved in. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, does he mean the auto the uh, auto flight engineer? Perhaps? I think so. Yes, I think so. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's not something that's popped up, but you know, um, Chris is already mad at me because I was beating him up about something earlier. So I'll just bring that to him just to make sure that you know. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the other thing is uh, smoke effects uh, and better visual, better visual effects in general. People. Yeah. Like. Um, let me answer that in one second. I, I want yeah. to point out one thing that just happened. That's actually pretty cool. Um, yeah. so I mentioned earlier that people think we're some like, you know, monolithic corporation in a, in a tower someplace and, mm -hmm. and we're not, um, you know, one of the things that I absolutely love about the fact that we are, you know, we're a very flat organization. We're just a bunch of friends that, that work together. Um, and, we interact directly with our customers. Some of the best ideas that have appeared in any of our products come from direct conversation with our customers. So, for example, you know, Paul, who just, um, you know, who just asked that question. So, you know, um, you know Paul, pat yourself on the back because what you did was you just you just put the idea in there, um, and now. In, in a future conversation, and it might not be this week, I, I might wait until I need to distract them from something I'm doing wrong. Um, <laughs> but I will bring up to, to Henning or to Chris, like, hey, could we give the, you know, the auto flight engineer different power settings? Could we make him use, you know, this cruise table or that cruise table? You know, could we do that? Um, mm. And so if that idea then appears in the airplane, I mean, you know, Paul, hey, it was, you brought it up and, and, it, and it came right, this conversation, this is where it started. This is what I love about, the reason the reason why I interact with our customers in our forum directly, person to person, mm. um, is for this. I mean, I can't possibly have all the ideas, and the guys on our team are some of the brightest, most imaginative people you'll ever meet. They can't possibly have all the ideas. Sometimes someone will say, "Hey, have you ever considered X?" And we'll all kind of look at each other like, well, "Why didn't you think of that?" Um, <laughs> and, and that's where the great ideas come from. Yeah. So I just wanted to point that out. This is mm. stuff like this is fun, and and mm. and. So uh, it matters. So Paul, well done. Okay. And so now that. smoke effects and things yes. like that. Um, the um, yes, uh, that is something that I really want. Um, and the uh, above everything else, just remember that I'm a, I'm a simmer nerd too. So it's, I love seeing this sort of stuff. Um, Jason, who is our, um, uh, he builds the external models. Um, and, and Jason is 
uh, incredibly talented, incredibly gifted, does incredibly good work. He's got such an eye for detail um, that I, he will pick out details in things. And, and literally, I will just sort of sit there shaking my head like, wow, I never would have seen that in a million years. Um, but he is one person and, and he is a very busy person. So, um, you know, literally we, we built break time into the end of summer for the whole PMDG team because I was worrying about him burning out because, um, you know, building a fleet of airplanes is very difficult and maintaining a 600, 700, 800, 900 with all the sub variants loads him up with work. Yes. So. Jason and I, you know, we'll have fantastical conversations about wouldn't it be fun? You know, we could we could generate, you know, get the smoke index to work so that it gets the cylinders firing in the right order and the swirl impact of the, you know, the of the the um, the slipstream from the propeller. And you know, we'll talk those things through. Wow. Yeah. And then it always comes back to, you know, if we only had about another three days a week, we could get this done. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, so it's a matter of you know balancing time. What starts to happen, um, and it will start to happen, I think, soon, is the triple seven kind of starts to get down toward the end of the ways. Um, what happens is, you know, each of us as a developer um, gets a little bit of free time, and mix that with a little bit of boredom, and all of a sudden it'll become, you know, Jay, what what will probably happen, um, and and Jason. Um, this is not an instruction. What will probably happen is, you know, one day Jason will be down the road finishing up, you know, something on the triple seven and he'll have, you know, a day where he just doesn't feel like working on the triple seven. Yeah. And it'll just kind of be intellectually interesting to him to pull up the DC six and see if he can get that little, that piece going. Mm. And that's where a lot of these little things come from. And then, you know, he'll, when he's got it where he wants it, he'll push it into our, uh, into our update system. And then the next time we roll an update out, it will wind up, uh, with customers. So, right. um, so yes, there are things that, that we're constantly looking at. Um, and, um, when we released the DC six, we didn't have smoke effects yet. Those came after we get the DC six out and it's just been a matter of trying to find time to work Jason back. He has been very busy. Um, so, but, um, but now that being said, there's a talk about freeware people. There's a, a freeware, um, on flightsim.to. I stumbled into one of our one of our beta testers um, pointed it out to me, and um, there is a freeware effect that will add smoke effects to the DC six, and it's it's not perfect, it, it, but it is it's better than nothing. Right. Um, and so I have that installed on my personal install of the DC six, and I think it's marvelous. And you know, and I that'll hop to the outside view when I first start the engine because I'm a nerd and I like to watch all that stuff. So yeah, you know, yeah. it's fun. Eventually, we'll get our own in there, um, and yeah. we have hours and hours and hours of video of what that airplane actually creates when it lights off. Um, and, yep. and we'll, we'll get that replicated someday. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you will. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. This is quite an interesting one that I, that I wouldn't have thought of. The real ace guard would like to know how the expectations of consumers have changed in your career as a developer uh, with changing platforms and the expectations for ongoing support. Can you ever really step away from a product release and actually call it done anymore? Um, no, we we really can't. Uh, we could. Um, so, you know, in the in the early days, you you published the airplane and that was it. You were finished. Um, you might do one bug fix, but you know that was it. You were on to the next thing. Along the way, when we moved from FSX to prepared we made a, a very conscious decision at that point to change our business model to, um, you know, to a product life cycle uh, that we would maintain it over the long term. And um, we have, um, you know, we have not pushed any updates into prepared now in a, in a couple of years. Um, but, um, you know, for example, you know, what I described with, um, you know, Jason, updating the, you know, he'll, he'll get bored one day and he'll just go and add some things to the DC six. And, you know, the DC six has been out for a year and a half, but we are actively adding new uh, GPS units to it. We're doing that because things have come available on the platform that will enhance that product mm. and sort of, you know, perpetuate its longevity and continue to, to enhance its usability for customers. We will continue to do that with the seven three seven for, you know, I mean, years. Um, yeah. So we don't have an expectation any longer that we will reach a point where 
okay, the 737 is done. We're not doing anything else to it. That mm -hmm. I just don't think that's realistic in an environment as dynamic as simming. Um, no. Now, there does have to be some balance. And we will, uh, you know, pretty soon here, the, the 737-900 will drop. And uh, we'll go through a, you know, there'll be a, an inevitable fix cycle that follows that. Um, I'm just, I'm going to ask this right here, right now, because it's what people I are dying no to know. Right. I have no idea. Um, okay. and, yeah. And look at that. You know, if I had given you a date, the sun just came out, you know, on the, in the, the window to the side. Yeah, of that yeah. I saw. Sort of hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apologize for the lighting here. We're at that time of year where I get the sunset right through the window here, which is which is marvelous. But it's, it's fine. Just just give us some news to uh, match it, Robert. Yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll a little bit. No. So, um, yes, the um, yeah, you know, do, do we know what's going to happen? You know, like oh, yeah. um, so the um, uh, so when the 900 comes out, um, it will. Um, you know, we'll go through an inevitable fix cycle, but then we will start, you know, we, we've already, we're already moving developers off the seven, three into the triple. Mm. We'll hit a point where we'll go through sort of, you know, we're, we're, we're working on the seven, three, seven. It went through this, this massive peak productivity period, and now we're kind of winding down on it, but then we're going to go into a peak productivity period on the triple seven. And when we're in this peak productivity period, we'll be in a lull in the seven, three, seven. Mm -hmm. There might be a couple of little updates that pop out here and there for, you know, major obstructions or platform changes that destabilize the 737. You know, we'll run yes. assets back, fix this, push it, you know, and then back to this. Yeah. Then the 777 will, will release and it will go through, you know, there's a couple of product cycles that in that 777 release. Then its work level will start to drop down, but the work level on the 74 will be going up and the 777 will be dropping down. And so then now you'll have the 777 and the 737 sort of down here while we go, you know. And so there's this this sort of natural flow of, of workload. Um, yeah. And during those, you know, when we're heavy at work on one product, we're still paying attention to that and and keeping it stable and you know and as we learn new things um, because that it will invariably happen uh, you know mm. we'll we'll learn new things about the platform as we're working on the triple seven and we'll say oh you know what we need to we need to push that back here um, we have a marvelously well designed modular development process now where. Um, you know, the FMS logic and, um, you know, the, the auto flight system logic and the flight director logic and the, you know, the, the, um, the logical systems that drive, you know, the electrics or the generators or the fuel tanks or, you know, all these different things, all of it is modular and there's a lot of commonality between the products. So as we change, you know, if I discover that the, um, you know, some, th some definition in the uh, integrated drive generator, you know, uh, you know, spool logic is wrong. Well, then it's probably wrong on all the airplanes. So you know, right. that will get pushed off to all of them. So, that, you know, there'll be little updates along the way. Yes. So, uh, but, um, but no, I, I don't see us um, ever really just you know, blowing the whistle and saying this is done. No, um, but, no. You know, and, but and talking about this, this, this workflow cycle uh, business, we'll asked earlier on um, that you were talking about doing the 737 MAX. This came up last year. Mm -hmm. um, and that you were vaguely talking about releasing it during the 777 release program. Mm -hmm. um, and is there a reason behind that? How does that fit into this sort of this flow of workload? That you um, so, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my phone and it's not because I'm like, you know, bored and texting. I'm actually going to, I'm trying to turn the office lights on and it's oh, right. the, <laughs> the app changed and I can't find the button. Okay. Um, but um, here we go. Uh, let's see here. There we are. Okay. Oh, yes. Is that a little bit much? Does that work? Okay. I think that's all right. Yeah. Um, so um, the, um, I'm sorry. Now repeat the question because I was only half listening because I was looking at my phone. I'm like a teenager. <laughs> that's, all right. that's all right. I'm only half listening to answers because I'm reading the chat. So it works both ways. Um, <laughs> People don't realize that all this is taking place at half, half concentration at a time. <laughs> uh, details on the 737 MAX were released that, last year. Yes. And yeah. your vague release time was during the 777 release program. Yeah. Is there a reason for that? And how does that fit into your uh, development flow? Yeah. So um, there is a tremendous amount of commonality between uh, Max and the NG series airplanes. So we're leveraging that commonality to uh, to bring that forward. There's, there's a couple pieces in here that I can't talk about. Um, 
because we are just finishing some contractual um, negotiations on that. Okay. Um, but um, but there's some there's things going on in the background that that we there's a lot that goes on in the background um, that we don't talk about. And mm. um, and one of the reasons why is that things change. Um, and, you know, we like to remain a little bit nimble and a little bit dynamic. Um, and oftentimes in the community, you know, if we say, you know, we're going to do the the triple seven, 200, you know, or you know, the, the, the LR and the F is going to be first. If I say that that's going to be first in the order and then something happens and it becomes, um, you know, advantageous from a schedule standpoint or, for, you know, from a manpower, you know, who's moving where um, to do the 300 ER first, for example, if I then go into our forum and say, change of plans, we're going to do the 300 ER first, even if it means the 777 is now going to release four months earlier, mm. I get burned at the stake for that. Um, so I, just I have that question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I have become very careful about um, what I say and yes. how I say it. The, um, there is a whole cottage industry that's cropped up around parsing things that I put in our forum, um, which, you know, makes me laugh because, you know, I will literally, I will write something. And then like 20 minutes later, someone will say, well, Rob just said that, you know, they're working on an A380. And, and I'll literally be like, <laughs> Where did this come from? Yeah, um, you know. So the, um, uh, but uh, the so there is there's a lot of stuff going on uh, related to the Max, um, and we are um, yeah we're playing our cards close to our vest. We've actually got a couple little things going on on the sides, um, but, but what we are talking about publicly is triple seven. Um, yes. That is, um, you know that that's um, that's that's our baby right now. So okay, yeah. So, so tri triple seven in in some form or other is the next next big release from yourselves, but potentially with the max coming out somewhere in the midst of the various variants for that. Yeah, I what I described was that um, we're currently envisioning the max sort of what we call slipstreaming, um, yeah. where you know our our development and release agenda is really going to be focused, um, you know, starting very soon. It's you know we're going to take the attention away from the nine hundred and and put it on the triple seven. So we're really going to be talking about you know the the triple seven products um, and their release schedule. But while all of that's going on, there's stuff related to max taking place, and when you know, if we get a, 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 a releasable form of the max, it doesn't matter where we are in the triple seven schedule. You'll yeah. wake up one morning and, and there'll be a, a, a max um, sitting in the inbox. So, right. um, you know, that's kind of how we're, we're playing it. We're, yeah. we're moving into, um, we're moving into an environment where we're actually going to give less information about the side products and more information about the the you know the, the primary products. So yeah. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It sounds eminently sensible, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um oh, there were some other questions about this sort of thing. Um Oh, this is, yeah, this is yeah, it's not about this sort of thing at all, but it's quite an interesting one. We're just going to jump about. I can't keep track of any kind of order. Um, what's your favorite non-PMDG plane to fly? Um, well, I fly an airplane made by Dassault right now. Does that count? Or we're we talking about in the sim? Um, I think we're talking about in the sim. But, oh, uh, um, you know, I really... <laughs> You know, and I feel badly saying this. Um, yeah. I really don't do a lot of, I don't do a lot of simming with non PMDG stuff, and and it's not that I, you know, it, it's it's not that like you know, oh, it's not good enough. Uh, you know, it, yeah. it it really isn't that. What happens is I find that when I feel like simming, I I'll load up one of our airplanes and I'll use the, you know, if I'm flying from A to B, I'll use it as an opportunity to to tinker with stuff that I'd like to be able to do um, mm. with the airplane or mm. Um, to refresh my memory of, of how the airplane is operated so that I'm more conversationally proficient in the forum with the actual operation of the airplane. Um, you know, the one of the things that I, I think surprised a lot of people um, is that I really don't know 
much about how the 737 is operated in the real world. I've never flown the airplane. Um, mm. and I've, I've never been to training on the airplane. Um, I, you know, I've, I've coded the daylights out of the thing for the last 20 years, but I, I've never really flown it. And, um, you know, I, I watched YouTube videos of other people doing stuff with our airplane and, and very routinely I'll, you know, sort of tilt my head to the side, like, you know, like a dog and, and go, Oh, I didn't know it did that. Um, you know, so, um, you know, that must be a nice feeling when your own product continues to surprise you. Yeah, it is. Um, and you know, and what's the other thing that's happening now too, is we're getting busier, um, and we're getting bigger and, and we're getting bolder with our products is that there's stuff that other members of the team were working on that I don't know anything about. Mm. Um, Mm. And, you know, I mean, we'll roll and push an update and I'll be reading through the change list and go, oh, wow, I didn't even know it did that. Um, And, you know, we've got um, uh, um, uh, Emmy is one of our uh, tech advisors on the 737 and he flies the airplane for a living. I mean, he he knows how it works. And Mm. so a lot of times I will go to our tech advisors and say, hey, you know, I've got a question about this system and this switch and this thing and this, that, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. and these guys will educate me on how it works. And I will take that information, compare it to all the engineering diagrams, make sure it makes sense, validate it. Um, you know, we've got some subject matter experts with access to the airplanes in real time. We'll get validation. We'll get video. I'll go and program it, make sure it all works. Great. Um, two weeks later, I couldn't tell you what it was we were talking about because I'm on to the next thing. Um, so, you know, yeah. I, you know, I don't, I, um, I love vintage airplanes. I absolutely love vintage airplanes. And so I, you know, I, I dove into the, uh, the 40th anniversary update cause it had a DC three and, you know, near, near and dear to the heart. Um, and I was, I was a little disappointed. Um, right. one of my, one of my favorite, um, add ons, one of my favorite add ons, not for Microsoft flight simulator, but of, in all of, um, you know, simming, um, was, um, a two A's, uh, Boeing, uh, three, seven, seven. Um, and three, seven, seven, three, three, seven crap. Now I get them backwards in my head. Um, yes, I'm not sure, but I, I can pick the plane you mean. <laughs> the Strato cruiser, we'll yeah. call it that. Cause then, yeah. you know, we don't look dumb. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I absolutely love that. And, and Scott Gentile at, at A2A, you know, he, he heard that from me, um, you know, just absolutely love it, but I love it because it is a, um, you know, it's it's sort of a thinking man's airplane. You really you you've got to plan ahead, and you got to work your engines, and you got to manage the you know the manifold pressures and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I I I wasn't a big fan of the um, there was you know an expansion they did where you know your flight engineer does what a flight engineer should do and tells you if you're doing it wrong. Um, I wasn't a fan of that because I I much preferred to have to suffer the consequences of screwing it up. But um, but I love stuff like that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's why I love our DC six, because you can really make your life hell. Um, yeah. if you're, you're not careful with it. Yeah. 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 Um, so talking of classic airliners and your love for them, um, obviously we've got lots of questions about future plans for Boeing's and modern airlines, but, but is this something that you'd like to do more of in the future? And are there any, are there any actual plans that for you to make something like say the Lockheed 1011, which someone asked about earlier or, the 707 or any anything else of that ilk that are you doing this again <laughs> what do you mean again <laughs> 72 so yes good so 727 very much uh, on the cards there i you know um so uh for you know dr Viles and i for years we have talked about when when the two of us reach the point where we've decided we no longer care anymore yeah what are we going to do um Yes. And uh, he and I have, you know, and, 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 you know, maybe it's just because we're a certain age. There are certain airplanes that when when I was a young boy dreaming about flying, when I looked up in the sky, there are certain pieces of metal that you saw. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I get older, they get rarer. Yeah. Um, and I would love to have those airplanes in the PMDG stable. Yeah. Um, you know, I am a, I'm a I'm a I have a I have a fetish for three engine airplanes. Um, it's probably unhealthy. My my wife is a psychologist. She has not been able to cure me of it. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, I I just absolutely love the the DC ten, the L ten eleven. Um, I'm going to skip over the MD eleven because that'll just create drama. Um, you know, the seven two seven. I just I love yeah. those airplanes. 
airplanes. Yeah. Um, you know, Dassault has a whole line of three engine airplanes yeah. and, you know, literally, uh, you know, I mean, get me in front of the, you know, get me in front of a, you know, the right Falcon. It literally just brings me to my knees. Um, Do you know, I love um, the 727 as well. It was one of the yes. first freeware add-ons I got for FS95 or FS98. It was, and I, I honestly, I don't think it was anything like the 77, but it was beautiful. And I just used to fly it from um, JFK to LAX and back. And that was yep. it. That was my life for weeks. I loved it. So, yeah, I'm keen <laughs> I, for that. <laughs> when, when I first started working for United Airlines, um, yeah. you know, I, I cleaned toilets on a, on a 727. And, the um, uh, you know, I, I just, there is something about the lines of the airplane that I just find to be incredibly appealing. Um, you know, it looks like it's doing Mach 0.84 just parked on the ramp. Um, and I... You know, I at the time, you know, I would sneak my camera into work and I would take photographs of them. And and when I um, I got relocated to Manchester, New Hampshire, and we had uh, there was a time of day, a couple times a week where we would get three 727s on our ramp in tiny little Manchester. Um, and I would take pictures at different times of day of the three tails lined up and the way the shadows and the, and the lighting would cross. And they just I still have the, the photographs and. I just think they're a beautiful airplane um, yeah. and they require thought and care um, to fly yeah. appropriately. Um, yeah. You know, there's, there is something to be said for when you, you know, if you bring those throttles all the way to idle, you better be planning ahead when, when you need the power because you're going to wait for it. Um, mm. And I would love to, um, I would love to punish simmers with that airplane. Um, <laughs> It would, you know, we've yeah. all gotten so spoiled, you know, these, these, you know, EEC and FADEC yeah. engines and stuff. I mean, it's all driven by, you know, it's, there's all kinds of regulatory compliance on how fast it should spool and all this other stuff. You know, you don't have to worry about getting behind the power curve on mm. a, in a, in a, in, a, in an NG or, yeah. you know, a seven, four or something like that. It's not going to lose energy fast enough that you can yeah. find yourself in that, in that corner. Um, yeah. You know, there was a, a, you know, there was a 727 in the early days, um, you know, going into JFK and they got in the corner and the airplane was losing energy faster than they could get the engines to spool and they came down short. Um, mm. I would love to do that to Simmers, uh, you know, and show you, hey, this is what it's like to, to really, really fly. Um, yeah. You know, I, um, the, uh, the airplane that I fly is sort of a baby 727. Um, and when we go to flaps 48, you better have the power up. Um, and yeah. The, um, you know, it's, um, it's sort of, you know, you, if, if you're on a three degree glide slope and you go to flaps 48, all of a sudden you see the little magenta um, trend line for the speed just drops off the bottom of the, of the, the, the primary flight display. Yeah. Um, and that's your reminder that this would be a really good time to start pushing the power up. Um, yes. Yes. Stuff yeah. like that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, Liam, please. I just got it for the love of God. Man. Uh, moving on. Um, Will mentioned earlier on, actually, the uh, <laughs> it's, it's a bit niche, but would it be possible in the 737 and other planes for the default squawk code to be uh, 2000 for the sake of VATSIM controllers? Uh, I have, I mean, anything's possible. It's software. Um, yeah. I think the, it's uh, 1234 at the moment, I think. Is it? Yeah. I don't even know is what it, it is. It? I would I think, think it would be 1200. Um, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, yeah, I, you know, little one to throw out. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah we so. always have to be careful to when we do stuff like that. We always have to be careful about what we, you know, which tea kettle we might knock over. Um, and I, I use tea kettle because you know I'm talking to you. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> the, the cultural uh, sensitivity. Yeah, you know, it's, that's me. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think it's funny because you know when I think it's set to twelve hundred. If we were to set it to 2000, is there some other offset that, you know, there's something else we would be upsetting over here because 1200 is considered to be a norm or is, or is normative for what we've done for 25 years. So, you know, we upset something over here. So, you know, we, it's something we'd have to think. Yeah. About. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's him something I'm, I'm, I want to try, but I'm afraid to. <laughs> <laughs> you should. I didn't do it for most of my simming career. And then I started doing this streaming business and everyone was like, well, You've got to do VATS. You've got to try VATS. And I was like, no, why do I want to talk to people? <laughs> I'll talk to the people watching the stream. I don't need to talk to a controller. And I did, and I tried it, and I never looked back, I have to say. It's, it's good fun. It's good. See, I'm, af I'm afraid that, you know, I'll, 
you know, I've got a well-practiced airline pilot voice. I'm, I'm afraid that I'll, I'll sign on to VATSIM and, you know, someone's going to get a recording of me getting tongue tied and, you know, or just yeah. completely botching a clearance and then it's gonna you know it'll be all over the internet you know you yeah know, there's more pressure i guess yeah. if you're, if you're, yeah, you if know. you're real that's true, that's true. Yeah, you'd be surprised how many times i get tongue-tied in the real world you, you know you get a controller gives you something and you just trip over it <laughs> oh no i bet i mean i'm doing my ppl at the moment and i'm about to do my cross countries and that is the thing that terrifies me the most i'm quite i know what i need to say oh, can i get it out no no Anyway. We had, uh, uh, I was coming back into DC you know, a week and a half ago, and we had a controller, uh, a Boston controller gave us, um, uh, she had slowed us to 250 knots at you know, 38,000 feet. And she gave us a descent and she gave us cross a fix at this altitude, then descend to when reaching accelerate to 300 knots. It was the most complex clearance i'd ever gotten yeah, and then she hands me off to a new york controller and i practiced it three times and then i switch over to the new york controller and i got it out on the first try and the new york controller said that is the most complicated clearance i've ever heard anybody check on me <laughs> and i told him i'm like i had to practice it before i could check in and he laughed and he's like okay cancel all of that descend to and accelerate to you know it was just it was funny you know so it it, it happens in the real world i mean you just you, yeah. you sit there and you're like i can't say all that in one yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah um right anyway back back to msfs things we yeah talked about the 900 um any news on the EFB? That's the other question that's been asked uh, a lot <laughs> yeah. repeatedly over and over again. It's actually a banned word in the chat because that's all anyone was saying. So yes, any news on that at all? <laughs> um, yeah, it's not going well. Um, the um, you know, it's uh, no, it, it it's going just fine. It the this is a you know, it, it's a it's a favorite topic for um, you know if you. You want to take the cudgel to PMDG. Oh, you know, this is what you yes, use. Yeah, yeah. And as soon as we get the EFB released, um, we already we have an internal bingo game going on as to okay, so once that goes out, what's the next thing that's gonna be the oh you know, there's yeah, always yeah, yeah, yeah. um but um yeah, so we made a decision early on. Um, you know, the, the EFB that's in the NGX and the NGX U in P3 in prepared um, is the original Boeing. 1995 era you know it's a it, it's a kludgy mess um yeah it's um it has uh you know all it it's got all the ui design of you know of a barracuda um i, I mean it's just it's a horrible device and uh, we originally put that in the the 73 because we have all the documentations for it yeah. and yeah. you know whatever and then after we put it in um we discovered that nobody bought it um, it, it was, it was almost like it was, you know, an aspirational idea for Boeing. Um, and it doesn't really exist in the wild. I mean, anyone who had an airplane with them has long since taken the cutter's torch to you know, getting it out of the airplane. Okay. And the whole world has moved to tablets. I, I mean, I, I use it, you know, I use a tablet when I fly, um, you know, and I've got, I've got, you know, weight and balance software that's, um, that's, you know, tailored to the airplane and I've got, you know, four flight with the Jeppesen charts and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and the we made a decision that it might be a wise idea to um, you know, looking forward at the entire product the scope of product catalog that we've got coming. Let's get rid of this class one EFB. Um, let's go to a tablet. And we made that decision um, based on some presumptions of um, the of how fast things were coming to us from a Sobo and how quickly some of the limitations that we knew of were, were going to get unlocked. Mm. Um, and we were wrong. Um, <clears throat> so we're still waiting for some of those, um, those functions to get unlocked. You know, I, I mentioned not being able to communicate, you know, between the airplane and the, the EFB and the, the local yes, channel. You did. Yes, the um, you know, we really thought we'd have all that stuff by now and we don't. Um, so we're engineering, you know, so, you know, now, you know, midstream, all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, we got to engineer our own, um, parsing language to to get data back and forth between the airplane and the EFB, mm. um, and so you know the EFB is in the airplane. Um, uh, we just have it suppressed. You you can't use it. Um, the the beta team is using it. Um, <clears throat> the beta team is is um, they're giving us a hard time on it right now. Um, and you know and and 
as they should. I mean, that's that's what we pay them for. Right. Um, uh, the, the joke there being that they don't get paid. But um, yeah, <laughs> but they, they there are some things about our design that that they're not happy with. And right. and so we're working to improve those things. Um, so in order to try to narrow the scope down, we have just, you know, um, we're focusing on one piece at a time. Um, and you know, the, the, the sim brief stuff works, the Navigraph charts work, um, you know, all, you know, the, 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 um, you know, where it puts the little airplane on the map and moves it around all the, you know, that stuff works. We can, yes. you know, we can get the route of flight in there, all that works. Um, and we are, um, you know, we're, we're still challenged by the inability to pass data back and forth between the, the airplane and the EFB. And if the, if the, the, um, HTTP stuff that we need was unlocked, we could have it done. I mean, in, you know, it'd probably take us a week to get that code running. Right. Um, but as it is, we're just, you know, we are spending a massive amount of time and it's frustrating. And the team that's working on the EFB, I mean, they are, they are as frustrated um, as any, you know, subgroup within the PMDG team right now, because they're, um, you know, we're taking a lot of criticism in public, like, oh, you know, PMDG can't do, you know, whatever. And it's like, you know, no, uh, we're literally trying to drag a 180 pound, you know, tire uh, strapped to our back, you know, up the side of, you know, Mount Planck. Um, and it's, it's frustrating. So it's coming. Um, one of the discussions that we've had internally is, should we toss it at users in limited format? You know, we've got, we've got certain functions that, that work. Should we just let you have those. Um, and we've, you know, we've talked about that, but, you know, this gets us into the sociology of, um, you know, of the flight sim community and the, the community tends to have very high expectations, um, you know, as, as they should. I mean, we have a well-established brand name and, and, you know, we speak quite proudly of our products. Um, so there's an expectation that when we put something out there, that it will be, you know, of a certain quality level. And, yeah. Um, I don't think internally at PMDG, any of us uh, really are are fully happy with what we're working with um, mm -hmm. for reasons we control and for reasons we don't control. Um, yeah. And so um, one of the things that I try to say, um, and I, I'm still trying to find a way to say it that it makes sense to users, is that, you know, if we know you're not going to like something, and if we know you're not going to be happy with something, we're not going to give it to you. Yeah. Uh, and that's just kind of the way it is. That's the right um, thing to do, I think. Yeah, I think you have to wait till it's where you want, where you want it to be before you, before you release it. Yeah, we, um, you know, we released a product once uh, that was not ready for market. Um, it, it, this goes back a ways, but we succumbed to some pressure and we put a product out that wasn't ready. And we've kind of resolved internally, we're not going to do that again. Um, you know, where there's there's a whole lot of discussion going on in the community about early access and, and that sort of thing. And, and that goes back to, um, you know, 2005 to 2008 with the, the whole, you know, there was Air Simmer and the A320 and, you know, selling it as early access and then it was never completed and it made the market really angry. Um, yeah. And I think that that did a lot of damage to the, the simming community. It, it shook people's confidence in developers in the sim community. And at that point, we had a conversation with our customers and we had a conversation internally at PMDG that, hey, we have an ethical responsibility and a moral responsibility to our customers that we will sell you a finished product, period. Mm -hmm. um, and so now fast forward to, to this year and we made this decision to tear the EFB out and we had a 737 that was, you know, effectively ready except for that. Um, but we also had some aspirational changes that we were going to make, um, you know, changes to the nav data um, to move it to a modern format. And, you know, we've had this long going project to upgrade uh, lateral nav and the flight directors and other things that we like to do just to make the airplanes more realistic, that it's going to yeah. benefit the entire fleet of PMBG airplanes. Yeah. And, um, we how do we release a 737 into the Microsoft Flight Simulator market, knowing that we're going to still want to update all these other things, and we just tore the EFB out and we're going to add a new one in. So we decided to call it early access, and we really had a raging internal debate about that because the in our experience in 2008, the community was left with such a such a bitter taste 
over the fact that a developer called something early access when they knew they didn't have the technical skills to finish it. And, and, and frankly, I think that that is an ethical failing um, that damages the community. And so we were very worried about using that terminology. Yeah. Um, in the 15 years since then, the, the concept of EA has, and what people's expectations are has changed dramatically. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and I liked, I hope, um, and, and we try very hard to, um, to stand by our products and continually update them. I mean, we've done, I think, 15 updates on the 737 since it was released, and there'll probably be, you know, another 10, 12 in, in 2023. Um, you know, that's just how we operate now. Um, and that's the norm in the in the the software community. So, you know, there's sort of this like crossing point where, well, we've got a really good product that is, you know, eminently usable, but we've got some high level stuff that's going to take some time. Where do those two curves cross? And you know, when do you put it on the market? And the EFB is is a challenging piece of that. Yes, uh, yes, so, yes. You know, I don't think anyone would say that a, that an airplane without an EFB is not a finished airplane. It's a it's a different kettle of fish, isn't it? It is, um, you know, and, but, but the reality is, you know, people, it, it's always, it's interesting, you know, um, a lot of users, uh, you know, they come into the PMDG forum and, and, um, you know, they, they, they'll lecture me about, you know, I need to understand the importance of a tablet and flying an airplane. And, you know, and, I mean, it makes me laugh. Um, you know, I, I use one every day. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you don't have to lecture yeah, me. Yeah. I, I know. Um, yeah. But the, but the reality is that it is not the central focus that folks think it is in aviation. What is the central focus is already there. Yes. Um, but but we're nerds. This goes back to the beginning of the conversation. We all like yeah. the gadgets and the nerdy stuff and the data connectivity and all, you know, like we love this stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, as a pilot, I love the fact that I can be at, you know, at 43,000 feet and I can, you know, I can pull a digital ATIS for, you know, Orange County, if that's where I'm going yeah. and I can see it, you know, we're 1800 miles away. You know, I, I love the fact that I can, you know, talk to, you know, I can, um, you know, I can text message, uh, you know, Minneapolis center rather than actually having to, you know, go through all that effort to reach up with my index finger and click the transmit button. I love that stuff. And I want that stuff in the sim. Yeah. All of um, but you know, there's some, um, we're a small team. Um, and, yeah. and if I put 100% of the team on the EFB, could we get it done more quickly? Believe it or not, no. Um, yeah. Because of these technical hurdles that, we, that we're engineering our way through. So, you know, we maximize the, the, the number of people working on it. And yeah. we're actually about to, to do some hiring. We're going to be you know, bringing some new developers on. And, um, you know, so we're, we're hoping that a combination of just you know continued brute force effort and um, you know and some unlocking of some stuff from a Sobo side will free us up to bring in a bunch of things that we have had in development since 2017. Um, you know in terms of you know CPDLC and data connectivity and all these other things. Um, yeah. really cool ideas that come out of the real world. So yeah, so CPDLC is something that came up in the questions mm -hmm. before before we started. That and uh, GFO. Mm -hmm. Is there any news on on, on either of those? Um, so GFO is um, an absolutely marvelous product, and were it not for um, for Microsoft Flight Simulator, it would have been out years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What wound up happening was, you know, we we um, you know we labored over should we should we announce what we're doing, um, you know, because it's not an airplane. And we labored over that um, and we decided, yeah, you know what, let's let's go ahead and we'll show our hand. Because at the time we thought we were about six, eight months from making it live. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember. <laughs> we, yeah, we misread that. Um, yeah, yeah. It, you know, there were some technical challenges that were that we thought we had solved that we didn't. Um, and so, um, you know, and then you know, we're, we're sort of working along and we've got a plan and Microsoft Flight Simulator was announced. And and when Microsoft Flight Simulator was announced, revenues for developers like PMDG imploded. I mean, it was like overnight. Yeah. If, if I were to show you a graph of our daily revenue production, um, you know, because that, you know, as a business owner, one of the things that I, I, I have all these little metrics that we use and our, our CFO, you know, puts them into graphs and shows them to me and they have colors and they're really cool. Um, if you graph... June of 2019, average daily revenue 
all of a sudden just goes bloop, and it drops a third, yeah. Um, yeah. which is a huge number. Yeah. And um, by the time we hit April of this year, average daily revenue had dropped 92%. Um, mm. So, you know, people stopped buying prepared products instantly. It, as soon as we all saw Microsoft Flight Simulator, especially once we got previews of it, nobody wanted prepared anymore. And, and the yeah. market ran and and mm -hmm. that did a lot of damage to the bottom line um we were in the midst of a hiring spree um right when um uh, you know the, when when all this went on and revenues imploded and then you know now i had covid to it um so we put all the hiring on hold you know my objective was to to navigate pmbg through this transition without without laying anybody off yeah. um, which we did um and um yeah, you know, and that is something that I I am very proud of our team. We backed each other through what was the most difficult transition in company history um, to get through uh, the, you know this this un, you know this unknown and very unstable COVID period, but also to get through this transition from a very stable prepared market to a very difficult period of time where revenues just evaporated, and now we're into Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, yeah. So during that period of time, we really lost the plot and we had to pull all the resources off of GFO to focus on the DC-6 because that was the test product to teach us how to move things into Microsoft Flight Simulator. Yes. Once the DC-6 was out, then we put all those resources. We literally piled the whole company on the 7.3 um, yeah. and, and, and got that to where it is. Um, and so, you know, the, the team, you know, they they all sort of, you know, I, we, we have a weekly meeting and I, and I think there's, all, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of unspoken eye contact that goes around the room when I start talking about like, you know, you know, and we need to get back to GFO yeah. because it's a marvelous product. Um, and it adds a whole level of gameplay that doesn't exist anywhere in simming. And, and I'm very careful in talking about it because, you know, I don't, I don't want to hand the idea off to anybody, but, um, but the challenge we have is we need the ability to communicate between PMDG airplanes and other stuff in the sim and stuff yeah. on the machine and until the Sobo gives us that, we literally can't run it. Um, so as soon as we get that, that will unlock that, um, and it will thrill our beta testers because our our beta team, um, you know, it's they still they still exist in the GFO universe and prepared. And it, it's always amazing to me. I look at it, you know, every now and then. I've got it on a screen, you know, in mm -hmm. the office, and, um, and it's and every now and then I'll just you know see a whole bunch of airplanes moving around in GFO, and they're all in prepared, yeah, and flying GFO. And if I if I plug in with them and say like you know I'm you're supposed to be beta testing this thing in the microphone. <laughs> Back to work, yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, and what yeah. they say to me is that they miss the gameplay element of GFO. And 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 I get that. Um, mm. and it's, I sometimes will just, you know, take time out and I'll do a little bit of simming myself. Yeah. And, you know, I... I I love our airplanes and Microsoft Flight Simulator, but I miss the gameplay element the GFO brings. So yes, um, yes. I'm looking for. We'll get it there. You know, we're, you know, we got a nice long timeline, and and once we get the the connectivity that we need, we'll bring that into Microsoft Flight Simulator. And I and 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 I bet you when when we get there, um, uh, you know, you you and I should reconnect because I I think once we give you the opportunity to play with it, you'll. Yeah you'll understand look back. yeah what i'm trying to talk in circles about i remember reading it and seeing the previews which i think used the 7.4 if i'm not mistaken and i yes. think that's a really good idea yeah i like the sound of that a lot so yeah i am i yeah. am looking forward to it yeah. um i'm gonna fire off a few more quick questions about future plans because i know that there's a lot of people here who really want to know yeah uh, might you make a 787 Um, would I like to? Yeah, sure. Um, yes. the, um, yeah. Um, so we're, we're having a, com we're having some conversations about that with, uh, someone else. Um, and, um, Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's um, interesting. and yeah, it is, uh, you know, and, and, and the, the people we're having that conversation with, they actually make seven, eight sevens. Um, so, you know, it, it's an interesting conversation. Yeah. Uh, but, um, and, and yeah, sure. Why not? That's... If I only had like three more days a week. <laughs> a week yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Cool. 
um yeah enough said i think so so maybe maybe not but you'd like to and yeah that's that's a good answer <laughs> but after uh, later down the line yeah okay um <laughs> um seven five seven seven six seven that was that was discussed or hinted at it's yeah. right there on the shelf it's kind of hard to see yeah and then there's another one i think it's that one right there yes i think so yeah, yeah. Can't really yeah so yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, you know, the, the seven five is, um, one of my favorite airplanes. Um, you know, it's, um, the, uh, I mean, yeah, what's not to love about it. So, um, it's on the list of, you know, there's, there's a whole list of airplanes that, you know, when we get through this, excuse me, this gestation period of moving everything into Microsoft flight simulator, we can't wait to finally you know get through the triple and the seven four so that we can um you know so that, that we can do the the next airplane yeah um, exactly. and there's a lot of things that weigh into that i you know i mean you know I, I just gave you a not so casual hint about you know there's somebody buzzing in our ear about a 787 um mm. and you know does that mean that that's what we're going to do i don't know um, you know, our, the, you know, the, when we start looking at it, the metrics of, of what we talk about, you know, we have a, a 757 cockpit um, that, you know, is basically ready to go. We've got a 767 cockpit basically ready to go. Those were done um, before Microsoft Flight Simulator appeared in, in the world and, and threw everything out the window. Um, right. you know, I mentioned that we don't talk a lot about what we've got going on behind the scenes because things get dynamic and we need to be able to move pieces around the board. Yes. You know, we we were we were we were kicking off development on a, on a seven five um, when all of this happened. So it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, quick change plans. You yes. Got to do all this stuff. Um, so would we like to get back to that? Yeah. You know, there's yeah. another one coming. Um, there's another developer out there who has one and, and, you know, we wish them all the success in the world with it. Um, mm. The, um, you know, does it mean we would or wouldn't do one? Not particularly. Um, you know, we, we've reached a point in our development process where we do what's interesting to us. Um, mm. You know, the um, there's been, you know, we've, I mean, I've spent a bunch of time flying, uh, you know, some A350 sims and, and, Gosh, that that is a cool airplane. Um, I would yeah. love, to do, you know, something like that. Um, you know, so that, but that was that was another question. Further non Boeing aircraft, modern non Boeing aircraft, you wouldn't rule out, perhaps, perhaps having a go. No, I I, I wouldn't. Um, the um, you know we and you know people think I'm being cagey when I say this. We literally don't know what's gonna you know when we get the seven four out at that yeah. point it, we, we've got this open slot now um yeah. you know what are we going to do next we yes. do not know what's going to go into that slot yet right. um we talk about it all the time um and eventually we will settle on an idea but yeah. um you know there's arguments to be made for doing you know you know something like an a350 and, I, and that's not me saying we're going to do one but the arguments for doing that are that it's this really cool data driven it's got all these displays and then you know lots of techie stuff and it's yeah you know, cool, it's fun and, you know aside from which it's actually a pretty beautiful airplane um, yeah. so um that would be fun and it would be intellectually interesting for us because it's it's different than what yes. we've done but then the arguments against it are we've got you know five and a half million lines of code that um, emulates just about every mechanical function ever built into a Boeing airliner. Yeah. So doing a, uh, a 787 would probably, if we're going to do a data-driven airplane, 787, probably easier. Plus we already have the professional contacts and the backing and the tech data yeah. and all the other crap. Yeah. Um, but doing a 727, yeah. gosh, that would be so much easier um, yeah. because not a data-driven airplane. It's, you know, it's a needle-driven airplane. So, yeah. you know, what do we want to do when we're done with the 7-4? Um, I don't know, but we'll make that decision and, yeah. and and it will become obvious. We'll start talking about stuff. I think it's obvious what you want to do once you're done with the 7-4, but I guess it's right. <laughs> team decision. Okay, so we've got 777, we've got 7-4 after that, the max somewhere, somewhere along the line. Mm -hmm. Yep. Then you would quite like to do a 77, but there's also 7-5s oh, and 7-6s yeah. in the works. Yeah, maybe one of those, like and seven eight. You'd also like to do, depending on how these discussions. Sit. Okay, I think yeah. that's enough questions. Probably. All right, go on. <laughs> seven three seven classic series. 
Is that something you don't consider? We, um, so there's a couple of guys on the team that lobby that one hard. Every time when yeah. we start talking about, you know, next airplane, um, there's a bunch of guys who lobby that hard um, mm -hmm. because they, you know, those also kind of fit into that, um, that era of airplanes where you have to fly. Uh, you know, you can't just push a button and, read the paper. Um, you know, you, you actually got to fly the airplane and, and that would be kind of fun. And, and I don't know if you remember, um, uh, Sublogic ATP had a, a 737 200 in it. And it was kind of cool. Cause that was really the first experience for a lot of simmers of, you know, an airplane that could be a real runway hog. Um, you yeah. know, you, you know, you'd load it up at O'Hare and if you filled the, the tanks full of fuel and filled it full of passengers, you know, it would take you a while to get it airborne. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And, um, you know, the, uh, things have changed a lot since that era and it would be fun to do one. Um, but, uh, you know, Henning would just, oh, he would love to do one of those. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, who knows? It really, we, we try to keep an open mind until the decision has to be made. Um, and the reality is the market likes the high tech techie you know, glass driven stuff. The yes. market really likes what we see when we're hanging on the airport fence, watching airplanes. Yes. Um, yeah. you know, when okay. consumers go on vacation, there's certain airplanes that they ride on and yeah. they want to come home and use those in their sim. So yes. if we give them a 727, you know, your average simmer is going to kind of look at that and go, did the Wright brothers fly that? I mean, <laughs> they've never <laughs> seen one. So yeah. that, you know, there's a reality. Relatable. Yeah. Mm. Uh, there, there's, there's a market reality and then there's, what would we like to do? And sometimes those cross, sometimes they don't. Yeah. There's two questions that go quite well together here. Kerno Dave says, what about smaller aircraft like company jets and turbo props? Daft Birdie says, please, Phil, but ask about why doesn't Robert make the Falcon they have? I got one on my, there's one right there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would, you know, I'd love to. Um, so, you know, it would be fun. It re really would. Um, and that falls into, you know, the team is always, when, when I had the DC-3, um, you know, in any conversation where we talk about what we're going to do next, the team would always say, if only, you know, this this a-hole that you know that owns a DC-3, if only he would let us do that one. Um, mm. And, you know, and, and I would laugh and, okay, you know, I, I heard the message. Um, but um, the, uh, the message being that they get to call me names. Um, we never got to it because it, it's, you know, the, the market realities and all the other stuff that we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, would I love to do uh, the, the Dassault airplane that I fly now? Oh, absolutely. It would be so much fun because, you know, an airplane that you fly, you can, you can put so much detail into the nuances of flying the airplane. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I did a, a series of, of videos for the DC-6, and and they get into a lot of details of the nuances of flying a radial engine airliner. Yeah. Because that's my background, and I understand it, and I can and I can share that with you. And when I do it, as a simmer, you watch that video, and then you go and you fly the airplane in your sim, and it makes it more engaging, and it makes it more immersive because you you understand now what you're seeing. It's not just, you know, we'll push the throttles and go fly. It's like, oh, i I, I got to worry about all this. Yes. We could do that with a, you know, if, if we model, um, you know, an airplane where we have particular experience. So, um, you know, so the seven four is, you know, is one of those. And, and um, you know, that the, the um, uh, you know, yeah, I, I would love to do that. I, I really would. Yeah. Would the market buy it? I don't know. Yeah, that's a. Darth that's a would buy it. I'd buy yeah. it. So that's yeah. a start. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'll sell two copies. So you and me, um, I can probably talk my mother into buying one because she's still good. You know? so it's your fault yeah. this thing's still running. Uh, so. Yeah. Um, we have to, there's a few questions coming about the 707. We did discuss that earlier. It's a lovely plane. Rob didn't say no, but uh, there's no plans at the moment. Am I right? And that was the gist of it. Um, what else have I missed in here? Uh, oh, yes, this was something I wanted to come back to. Um, the weather radar, we know that the functionality that Asobo have provided at the moment doesn't allow you to do what you want to do because it's 2D data rather than 3D data that you need. Um, is there, however, any light on the horizon with that and also in terms of windscreen wiper effects? Um, so we have, um, 
Yeah. So with weather radar, um, you know, the, the issue is that we need to be able um, either. So weather is three dimensional. Um, yeah. and, and when you're flying, um, you know, when, when I'm flying, you know, across the country or, you know, over water, whatever we're doing, um, there is a whole art to manually running radar to be able to see what's going on in front of you. And, you know, the um, modern airliners um, that are software driven, they do all of this stuff for you. Most airline pilots nowadays have a dangerously low level of knowledge of what their weather radar is doing for them to right. show them returns. Yeah. Um, but the, the most modern weather radar on a 737 is it's running a whole scan up and down and side to side. And it is building a 3D picture of what it sees. Yes. But it's not showing it to you. And yeah. there's then a whole bunch of heuristics that go on. And if it decides like, hey, you know, this cell is building and they're going to go right over the top of it, it will then start to show it to you to get your attention drawn to the fact that, hey, this could potentially require you to exercise some aeronautical judgment and go around. Um, and um, there's, uh, you know, the, the, the radar in the max even goes so far as to identify potential locations for hail uh, disbursement. It'll um, uh, locate potential areas for a high lightning activity. And it puts these little markers on the radar and it's all really cool stuff to do all of that. Um, really probably has to happen inside the sim and a yeah. sobo needs to figure out how to hand that three-dimensional data back to users like us so that we can then display it on the on the the nav display in the airplane mm -hmm. and i think they and and, and i want to stress that i don't have any information on this topic that that is not in the in the community already but my knowledge of what goes on in terms of the platform development and um, and what goes on uh, in, you know, how software goes from, you know, A to B, I, if I were to bet, I would bet that a Sobo has a vision for how the weather engine is going to work and what it's going to look like when it's done. And they're not there yet. And mm -hmm. so they don't want to expend a whole bunch of energy giving us a bunch of tools to, to create weather radar when everything that it works with is still changing. So okay. if, and, and again, this is my guess. Yeah. I guess that when they get the weather engine to a static point, then they'll shift attention to, okay, so now that we've got the weather engine, yes. Now let's build a tool that will allow us to take those those picture slices that you know all these that we need in order to, to recreate weather radar. Yeah. The it question then is, will they do all that work internally and hand us you know a render to texture that we can then just display based on okay you know the the radar is at this you know this you know it's at this azimuth and this you know whatever blah blah blah, or yeah. will they require us to do the parsing? Yes. My experience with a Sobo tells me these are these are a bunch of really smart cats. They're probably going to give us they, they, they will probably tell us, hey, you know, tell us what the angle of the the, the, the weather or the radar is and what the range is set to. And we will give you something back. Mm. That would be my guess, um, which is, you know, and if anyone from a Sobo is watching, I'm not trying to teleport anything to you. I'm literally yeah, it based on my experience. Yes. Um and once they get that, then all of a sudden, literally just one day, every add-on out there will have weather radar. Um, oh, I imagine so, that. you know, so people people like to jump on, um, you know, different developers and they're like, oh, you know, how come you're not? Because this one is and whatever, blah, blah, blah. And, yeah. you know, we're looking at something and we're saying, hey, there's still a pretty there's still a pretty strong rate of change in this. It's very dynamic. And I, as a developer, I would just as soon sit on my hands with it, get so let a Sobo get to a point where they say, okay, this is ready. Go ahead and connect in. And then mm. we're up and running. Um, with, with wipers, it's actually very similar. We did wipers um, in 2009 in, um, in FSX. And mm. you want to talk about something that kills frame rates. That kills frame rates. Yeah. Um, in prepared, we did it again. And um, not quite as heavy on frame rates, but still pretty heavy on frame rates. And it's also kind of fragile in it. And it really... 
it, I don't know. It, you know, I've, I've got a, a lot of time looking through rain soaked windshields and it's just not very convincing to me. Um, the, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the, um, uh, the la- you know, a couple of weeks ago I was out flying and I wished I'd had a GoPro to, so that I could like, you know, take a picture of what I was seeing out my window with respect to rain. Cause yeah. um, it doesn't look anything like what it looks like in the sim. And, and, and I would like to see it look like it looks like when I look out the window, cause it's actually kind of neat. Um, but, um, you know, we made a decision early on that we were going to wait. Uh, we reached out to Asobo and said, Hey, you know, the wipers don't do anything. And they said, mm. yes, we're working on that. Mm. Uh, and as soon as they said that we decided, okay, we're not going to invest the development time in to building all the layering and the animation that goes with, you know, this whole thing. Um, it's, it's a lot more complicated than you think it, to get it to all, you know, to line up with the wiper and to, you know, all the other stuff that goes with it. Um, we decided not to invest the development time in that because my concern was, you know, we put four or 500 hours of development time into that. And three days later, a Sobo <laughs> makes theirs live and theirs will probably work better than ours because they're working at the core of the SIM and we're not. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't want to waste that development time. So we just decided the heck with it. We'll wait. Um, we check in with a Sobo now and then like, you know, Hey, is this coming? And you know, yeah, it's still yeah. coming. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> Yeah. when the radar yeah. went okay yeah. <laughs> right yeah, you know, yeah. Probably the same day um so uh yeah so you know that'll come when it comes it's um it is something that we just we don't see it as being so important that it must we must make that development investment to get us through to when a sobo finally gets you know theirs done yes. um in in a situation like that it is always better to use what comes from the core sim it's going to be more efficient. It's going to be friendlier on frames. Yeah, that is something that we are absolutely, uh, we're just, we beat our heads on the wall to protect performance in the sim because um, it needs to be fluid. It needs to be smooth. It needs to be good. So yeah, and you've done you've done a good job of it. Thank, so far. thank you. Um, I should ask about uh, Xbox. There's a few people asking about that. MP901 wants to know. If there are any updates on PMDG on Xbox with Wasm potentially coming to it in uh, Sim Update 12? Um, again, the big asterisk qualifier that I don't have any information that the community doesn't have. Um, my understanding is that SU12 will allow um, C++ Wasm-based products to run on the Xbox. And as soon as that uh, is verified as true, we will republish to... Um, uh, to marketplace and and theoretically, um, barring any surprises, it should be it should be uh, we should be live and ready to go. And and um, the um, you know with Xbox, <clears throat> when we export the airplane for Microsoft Marketplace, there's literally there's two check boxes, mm. PC Xbox. And when we do the export for Marketplace, we uncheck the Xbox one because we know it doesn't work, and they've told us not to check it. As right. soon as they give us the okay to do it, we'll check the box and off it'll go. You know, it's, right. it's um, yeah. So the nice thing that Asobo has done is they have created a platform that is, um, that will allow, when we develop something, it will work on both. Yeah. There's going to become some hiccups here. Um, there's some features that you can use on a PC that will not work on an Xbox. And um and we think, you know, for example, anything that wants to connect to the outside world is going to be a problem on the on the Xbox. We don't know yet because we haven't seen it, but mm-hmm. I'm sort of projecting based, again, based on knowledge and experience, there's going to be a few things that you, you know, if you buy it through Marketplace and you've got it on your PC and you've got it on your Xbox, there'll be some things you can do on the PC that you can't do on the Xbox. That being said, I, you know, you know, if I can take this opportunity to crush something that comes up every now and then, people will be like, oh, you know, PMDG is dumbing down their product in order to have it run on Xbox. Yeah. No, we're not. Um, <laughs> that That's, no, that, that's not happening. Um, if we were put into a corner where we had to decide, give you core functionality of the airplane or have it be compatible with Xbox and PC, we would do this. Um what we have seen so far and what we know of the massive effort going into this behind the scenes at a Sobo, um, they really want it to be a seamless experience between the two platforms and um, they're working really hard at it. And, Mm -hmm. and it's um, I I really, you know, I'm saying this a lot. I don't think people understand how much work is going on at a Sobo to give people 
a great experience across a range of platforms and a range of hardware and a range of capabilities, it's huge. I yeah. mean, it really is. Um, and, you know, I, I have been critical of a couple of things that they've said or done. And I, you know, and I, a lot of times afterwards, you know, I, I feel badly about it because it's easy to be critical on little things and ignore the preponderance of what else they've accomplished. Um, and so, um, we, we will as soon as they make that little box live and tell us we can use it. We'll click it. And it we'll it still it still blows my mind on a regular basis. The simulator in a way that no sim ever has before. Just in terms of how, not only how it looks but how real it feels. And yeah, I think I think you're right. I think it's, it's probably in our nature as flight simmers as much as anything to you know to pick at the to pick at the holes and be frustrated by the things that don't work. And, but it is an incredible product and it is it is going in the right direction, I think. So, yeah. yeah. Um, on the subject of rain on the windshield, not looking like it does in real life, is it frustrating when you're a real life pilot seeing the limitations of flight sim or the ways that it doesn't match one to one with real life? Do you find that more frustrating than perhaps we do? Yeah, it, um, you know, I think those things stand out more. Um, yeah. And they, you know, they just kind of, I think, well, you, you know, I think they would annoy me more um, if I, didn't do what I do for a living. Um, I understand the limitations behind it. Um, mm. And so what I try to do is um, think ahead to, um, you know, to, you know, if I'm going to be out flying, you know, next week and I know we're going to be going into, you know, specific weather, um, you know, I'll try to bring a camera along and record bits of data that I can then try to hand off to say, Hey, you know, this is what it looks like. Um, you know, I, I, our, our contacts at a so boy, they're, they're getting really tired of hearing me talk about turbulence. Um, yeah. and you know, um, I, I just, I'm not, I don't like the way turbulence is modeled in Microsoft flight simulator. I think it is a, a gamification of, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that if you were to hop in an ultralight and go flying on a hot summer day, um, that's what it feels like, yeah. but you know, thermal disturbance on a hot summer day in an ultralight is very different when experienced when flying a 180,000 pound 737, um, <clears throat> you know, or, you know, we're getting there closely, I'm, you know, a million pound 747. Um, yeah. and, um, you know, I, I, back in, September, uh, I had the misfortune of flying through a hurricane, um, in, in real life. Oh. Um, and the, um, the turbulence going through, we, we were literally about like 40 miles South of the eye wall, um, just getting our teeth kicked in. Oh. Um, and that turbulence was not nearly as bad as what I run into, um, you know, just this morning doing a day VFR approach to, you know, 10 knots of crosswind oh, gosh, yeah. going, going into Dubai uh, in yeah. Microsoft Flight Simulator. So yeah. it almost to me feels as though they've maybe dialed it up a little bit. Uh, I, I think, think you're right. It's you know, it, flying anything lighter than a CRJ. is just impossible if there's any wind and it shouldn't be. Uh, yeah. 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 And it's, um, you know, and so I, I, um, I, I tried good naturedly to sort of, you know, offer some feedback and some real world experience. And I'll, you know, um, I take videos of, you know, the altimeter in my airplane and, you know, going through, you know, moderate turbulence where, you know, literally I'm, I'm, you know, like got myself pressed back in the seat and I'm trying to keep the cameras still. Cause you know, we're getting shaken like, you know, the inside of a rattle can yeah. um, so that they can see what the altimeter is doing during that period of time. And, you know, yeah. and, the, and the, you know, we've got an IVSI, so, you know, you can see every little, Twitch on that needle, and I'll try to show that so that they understand how little motion there really is. Um, yes. You know, if you to conceptualize turbulence, picture driving in a car going down a dirt road. Picture like the worst bumping you've ever got. You know, like as you're driving down the road, you go over. Well, for you, you'd be on the wrong side of the road, so I guess it'd be this. <laughs> but um, you know, but you're yeah. going down a dirt road and you're going yeah. over bumps, and what that feels like. Yeah, that's how much your airplane's moving. It's yeah. very similar. No, I mean, you know, are, there, are there instances where the airplane will drop 60, 70 feet and people will bang off the ceiling? Yeah, that does happen, but it's really rare. Yeah. Um, and so I'm still trying to kind of nudge them along with some of those things. And, um, and I, and, you know, you have to be careful. You know, it, there comes a point where you're just being a dick. Um, and I try really <laughs> hard to, to yeah. get that point. 
but um, but I do reach out. I, I, you know, there's there is there's a developer at, at Asobo um, who I think he drew the short straw. Um, I think he must have pissed the bosses off. So they're like, you have to be the one that talks to Randazzo. Um, and you know, he the poor guy. You know, he he hears from me. And he's just he's so good natured. And he's so kind and gentle. And I think when he sits down in the morning and he sees messages from me, I just think he wishes he'd taken up drinking. Yes. Um, so. <laughs> but but you're but you're being a dick for the best possible reason, you know, the betterment of this hobby. There's no there's no greater calling than that. I know. I'm trying. <laughs> um, but um, yeah. no, I, I am. I'm trying. Um, yes. You know, and but there's there's cultural differences too. Uh, you know, I mean, we're talking about you know, differences in national cultures and, and my way of communicating faults is pretty direct. I mean, that's just, it's kind of an American thing. Um, yeah. and you know, we're, you know, if, um, if, if, if there's something not right, I'm just gonna say, Hey, that that's wrong and it needs yeah. to be fixed. And, and, and if someone says that to me, I just kind of go, Oh, okay, well that's wrong. I'll fix it. Um, mm. culturally that doesn't stand up all the time. And, and that's, um, something I'm trying to learn that, you know, sometimes you have to, you have to be, more thoughtful in how you communicate. Um, yes. And sometimes I'm not. Um, so I'm trying. Um, <laughs> That's all you can do. That's all you yeah, can do. And I'm sure they appreciate that. Yeah, as much they do. As you do. They do. And they do respond, by the way, and that yeah. and that's important. You know, at one point early in our 737 sim process, I had it sitting on the ground at my home airport on a clear day. Yeah. And and the windows iced over. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mm-hmm. sort of tilted my head and looked at that. And I'm like, well, this is wrong. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I, you know, fed them a whole bunch of information and they, you know, they looked at some stuff and they discovered what was causing that and they fixed it. Uh, you know, it, 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 it does work. Um, and they have, you know, they've got a wonderful team. They've got a ton on their plate. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, someday the poor fellow at a so, but I'm not saying his name intentionally because I don't, I don't want to attract attention to an outpouring of pity no (laughs) yeah but if he if he he sees this he knows who he is and um you know he's probably going to retire early and and um you know they'll find him in a rocking chair someplace mumbling my name um but (laughs) you know anyway it is what it is yeah Yeah. great now there are so so many fantastic questions that have come in and i want to ask them all but if i did we would be here for at least another three hours um I'm going to ask a couple more. Sure. And I'd really quite like to finish because Wojtek here has, lit, has threatened, has really done, gone out of his way to make me ask this. I'd like to finish off by hearing a bit more about your DC3 trip across the Atlantic. I think that'd be a really nice question to end on. But before we get to that, before we get to that, um, would there be a chance for a 747 SP? Wouldn't that be fun? Um... It would. Yeah, that would actually really, that would, so we were talking in the beginning and I mentioned that if, um, and I, while we've been talking, I heard um, uh, the lovely Dr. Randazzo, she, she dashed out of the house and I'm sure she's going to find that winning lotto ticket. Oh, good. I hope she if she this succeeds time. this time, yeah. I mean, I've only asked her to do one thing. Yeah. If, you know, if she succeeds this time, yeah. there is a 747 SP for sale. Um, uh, so, hey, uh, Paul, if, you, if you're listening, w- like really, I mean, you know, yeah. wouldn't want a 747 SP, right? <laughs> exactly, um, yeah. So anyway, um, uh, Paul uh, is funny. Every now and then, I'll bring up the idea of a 707, and he literally like, I'll like take a picture of one, or he'll hear me talking about one somewhere, and he'll just text me the word no. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> right. You're not buying a 707. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, the. Um, uh, I gosh, I would love to do that. I think that would be so much fun. So, yeah, if I can get to the point where where we're designing air, the airplanes that like that we want, not like what the market wants, yeah, the, the, the SP would definitely be high on that list. And and so would the L ten eleven, just because that is a that's a, just a sexy airplane. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we um, ever get there? Who knows? Just to say, <laughs> no. Okay. Um, will this stream be available as a VOD later? Yes, it will It'll be available as a VOD here and it will also be getting uploaded to YouTube 24 hours later after we finish. Triple seven X, is that on the cards? It is. Good. Yep. And, Good. Um, and actually that, you know, I mentioned that there's um, some folks that they have a side job of making 787s. 
um, yes. that they've been buzzing in my ear about that. Um, that buzzing actually comes out of the the, the conversation that is um, uh, going on around the the um, data access and things that we need to um, get triple seven X done. So, um, and there is some, there are some synergies between PMDG's efforts and and Boeing's um, and 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 an effort taking place within Boeing um, that uh, makes that extremely likely. So, um, right. where and when, who knows? Um, I'm I'm I am. Um, too old and too skilled to to guess at that just yet, but but yes. that would be pretty cool. Yes, yeah, yeah, it would, it would, it would. Um, and this is quite an interesting one from Ian. Uh, would PMDG or have PMDG ever considered making their own simulator, as their aircraft have proven to be the best on the market? Um, Surely, a simulator would be next level, or is it not that easy? Has that ever crossed your mind? Well, no, it's not that easy. Um, but we almost no. did. Um, in 2000, thirteen, I think. Yeah. Um, so like 13, 14, um, we partnered together with um, some folks from Aerosoft, um, uh, Just Flight. Oh gosh, there was somebody else in there, and I am a horrible human being that I can't recall who it was. Um, but and there was also an investor, um, and we put together a coalition that approached Microsoft with the interest in buying the core um, intellectual property for uh, FSX. Mm -hmm. And as part of that conversation. Um, we did a full top-down analysis of, you know, what would it take and, and what would it cost and what would we do? Now, pretend for a minute that that had all succeeded compared to what has been accomplished by a Sobo, wouldn't have even come close. Um, the, the technical know-how and the resources and the knowledge that it takes to build this thing are astronomical. It takes the investment of a a company with the capital investment program of Microsoft to make this happen. And it takes a company with the development skill and resources of a Sobo to make this happen. But pretend for a minute that we're in a universe where none of that exists, um, which was 2014. Um, what we wanted to do was sort of gain control of a platform so that we could make it do what we wanted and create stability, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Um, that conversation got very, very far down the road. Um, we were, you know, we were already through uh, financing terms and a bunch of other things that go on to put something together like that. Um, and Microsoft decided to then open it up. Um, and so dovetail uh, uh, came into the game. Yeah. And I have always thought that we were sort of used as pawns to increase the cost or increase the price that Dovetail would eventually pay. Dovetail yeah. was better positioned to buy it than we were. Um, and, and by we, I don't mean PMDG. I mean the, this organization that we were working as part of. Yeah, so. um, and Tom Allensworth from Avsim was um, heavily involved in, in the discussion. Uh, Tom was a, a dear friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, it got fairly far down the road, uh, and then it it was the the intellectual property was awarded to Dovetail. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why we pumped the brakes in that um, I am a I'm a, I'm a detail nerd. Um, I read contracts, and one of the things that was inserted in the intellectual property licensing agreement was that at any time. Microsoft could recall the intellectual property and any changes that we had made to it, we would have to surrender ownership of those changes to them um, and that they could do with that as they wished. And so right. one of the things that one of the red flags that went up was like, hey, we could, you know, we could literally make the world's greatest flight sim. Mm. And the day before we go to market, Microsoft could say, hey, thank you. That's ours. We'll take it now. Um, yes. And they were not willing to talk about that aspect of the contract. And so it caused me to sit back and say, hey, you know, I'm not putting PMDG's money into, into that. And we really yeah. took a foot off the gas and we slowed down. Um, but what we learned from that was stick to what you're good at. Um, you know, there's, um, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a, an aviation history nerd. And there was a period of time where, um, you know, my alma mater, United Airlines, 
decided that they wanted to own the entire travel experience and they bought their, they bought the rental car company, they bought the hotel company and they had the airline and the whole thing just went up in smoke because they couldn't control all of it. And so a um, new CEO came in and, and he sold Hertz and he sold, I think it was Weston. I forget which hotel it was, but they sold the hotel off and, and he said, we're an airline. We need to focus on being an airline and being the best airline we can be. Yes. And that is a mantra that um, comes up at PMDG. Um, you know, occasionally we get um, approached with, you know, partnership ideas and um, yep. and and lateral business ideas, and and we'll entertain them and we'll talk about them. But I, um, you know, we have walked away from fairly lucrative contracts um, put in front of us by uh, by CAE or by Boeing, um, mm-hmm. and um, you know, because it would be such a distraction from what we do. We are a company that makes retail flight simulation. Yes, we happen to be very good at it. I think. Yeah. Um, and if we're going to get distracted by, you know, worrying about this over here, you know, building a simulator from the ground up would be a um, it would be a fool's errand for a company of our size. Now, yes. if anybody out there has one hundred million dollars and they would like to you know, help fund my aviation habit, um, you know, click the link below. Um, <laughs> You know, let's have a conversation. Um, yeah. But uh, but I think it would t- to make a, a platform that is as good as what uh, Asobo and Microsoft have created would be a waste of time. They're already there. They've got the platform. Mm. You know, there's no need. Yeah, very um, yeah, very hard to compete with going forward. I think, um, which is why I've not asked any of the X plane questions because I just think that'll muddy the waters. You you don't have any X plane plans at the moment, do you? Or no, we don't. No. We, we really don't. We, uh, you know, and and if Asobo and Microsoft doesn't happen, would we? I don't know. Uh, you yeah. know, I, I, I try not to play those games. Um, you know, the, yes. the pad's not taken, but, um, you know, we um, we explored it. We experimented with it. And um, there were a whole lot of business reasons why we, we decided to, you know, stick to what you're good at. Um, yes. And, you know, this is our channel. Stick to it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very fair deeds. Um, Liam would like to know, and I can't stop looking at it now either, what the blue uh, sticker is on your map behind you that seems to say save or saw or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, actually, hang on. Let me, let me grab that for you. Yeah. So when, um, so I think a lot of, you know, a lot of us aviation nerds have, have watched um, Ice Pilots and uh, Mikey McBrien, who um, I am, I am, I'm proud to say that that uh, I'm proud to call Mikey a friend. Hmm. Um, Mikey and I met through the DC3 community um, when we were preparing to uh, take the DC3 across to Europe. Mikey had started his his own little channel that he called Plane Savers, and okay. um, he it, it's like episode three or four in his thing. Somebody pointed out he needed a logo, so he he pulled out a piece of paper and a sharpie and he wrote plane savers on a piece of paper and he you know, holds it up to the, the camera. Right. So um, as we were getting ready to go, I sent Mikey a video about our DC three, just, you know, sort of the history of the airplane and, you know, where it come from because people had started to, to do this and to sort of give him additional content for his channel. And, yeah. and you know, Mikey is just absolutely, I mean, I'm, I'm not enamored of, you know, celebrities and and you know I've, I've met you know a ton of different people in, in the course of my career and I, I don't you know they, they say I, I had um, uh, coffee yesterday with a, a good friend of mine and, and he used the phrase you know never meet your mentors um, mm-hmm. or never meet your heroes um, because yes. they never they never quite live up to you know what you think and Mikey would be the sterling exception to that a nicer human being you will not find. Um, he is absolutely a gem of a human being. Everybody should have a friend like Mikey McBride. And so we sent him this video. And, and so I was poking fun at him a little bit. Um, I took a blue, what's known as a blue um, shop towel, because anyone who's ever worked on a DC-3 has a budget line item specifically for these things. So I thought he would understand the joke. Um, and then yeah. I, I literally just, I did that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. And so, you know, down on the uh, down on the the lower right hand corner, there is um, is that your right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. 
a little dyslexic, yeah. um, is the, the PAA logo that was on our DC3. And on the, the, uh, the other side is a character. It is a uh, caricature of myself that I have drawn since I was in high school. Right, uh, right. And, uh, and I've used it for everything. Uh, my daughter, you know, I draw him on little notes I leave for my daughter, you know. And, and, nice, yeah. Um, and it's just sort of uh, it's sort of a little thing. So yeah. that that's what that is, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, Plane Savers was, uh, was Mikey's channel. And so... Right. Um, so I sent him that and he did our, he put our little video into, you know, his episode and, uh, and it was kind of neat. It was sort of fun. Yes. Yeah. 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 Ah, fantastic. Now, listen, I do think we probably ought to start thinking about bringing it to a close. Would you agree, Rob? Or do you want to keep going? It, it is, you know what? I, I, I told you I canceled my whole afternoon just to uh, make sure, you know, so. Um... In that case, let's keep going for a little bit. Let's keep going. <laughs> this, it's, I'm really enjoying this. It's fascinating. And people's questions are really good and I want to ask them all. You know, um, and, it's, and it's and I, you know, I, I told you the only obstruction that I was going to run into was eventually Solo would come up here to let me know that it's dinner time. Um, yes, so there's no sign of the. Uh, yeah. It's amazing to me that she has not rolled up here because um, Solo is my golden retriever, and I'm a yeah. I'm a complete dog nut. Um, I you know, um, although I. I try not to say this when she's around. The whole reason I wanted to date my wife when I first met her is because she had two dogs. Um, right. But yeah, it's a good reason. The, um, yeah, you know, and that's not really true. Um, <laughs> <Of course. laughs> but uh, but so it's funny. I do, you know, I'll do, you know I, I sit on the boards of a couple of companies and I'll do meetings, you know, this way. And she always appears. Um, and, and to the point where if I'm at a meeting and she doesn't appear, people will ask if she's okay. So the yeah. fact that she hasn't been up here is sort of amazing. Nice. Um, but she will roll up here right when it's her dinner time to make sure that I know. So, um, you know, she's got a, she's got an internal clock that could you know run the German railroad. It's pretty fun. <laughs> um, you wanted to talk about, you wanted to hear a DC three story. I, yes, we did want to hear a DC three story. So, yes. hang on, let me find my, um, so this is my, all right. So this is our, this is our DC three. Um, and the, um, let me see if I can hold this in a way that it's, that it's visible. So this was, this was made by Herpa wings. Mm -hmm. Um, actually let me make sure I said that right. Yeah. It was made by Herpa. Yeah. Um, so they reached out to me when, um, when we were, oh gosh, it was right about the time we were starting to talk about the uh, the transatlantic, and they asked if they could do our airplane. Um, and so, I mean, who wouldn't say yes to that? Yeah. Um, so the um, this airplane uh, never flew for Pan Am. Um, it was actually a CBS Corporation, the Columbia Broadcasting System, is a U.S. television broadcaster. It was their corporate airplane. It had um, come out of the factory in uh, late October of 45. It was handed over to the U.S. government. They had purchased it as a as a transport um, on November 5th of 45, which just happens to be the day my dad was born. Um, and they just didn't need it. They flew it immediately to the desert and parked it. Um, and CBS bought it. They flew it to New York and had it converted from a C-47 to a DC-3C. And then they used it as their uh, as their corporate transport. It was sort of the equivalent of having a Gulfstream um, back then. And they operated it until the late 60s. And there's a, you know, a bunch of rotations that it went through. And it, it did tours over the Grand Canyon for a while. And it was owned by EAA, which is known by a lot of aviation folks. Um, uh, they're the folks that put on the Oshkosh show. Um, yeah. And um, accumulated some pretty cool names in the logbook, um, you know, different people who rode on board or who flew her. Um, and then she wound up up in Alaska, uh, was actually the last passenger carrying DC-3 on a, a U.S. scheduled airline certificate in the United States um, and was flying passengers all around Alaska with Era Alaska Airlines. And um, in 2003, the U.S. FAA, because they are the smartest government organization ever created. Yes. <laughs> um, they decided that um, because the airplane was being operated all the way up in Alaska and because they had, you know, required ballistic bulletproof cockpit doors on airliners, that this airplane needed to have a bulletproof cockpit door um, because they were very worried somebody might hijack it and fly it to Washington, D.C. and crash it into a building. It's a fair concern, really, isn't it? Um, yeah, and inevitable. so... 
Yeah. And so there's a question that comes in here about like, if our fighter radar systems aren't good enough to find it in the three days, it would take you to go <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. But because they said, so yeah. uh, the airline that had it just, it was not economically feasible. So they parked it and it, it sat for years. Um, and I lived in Reno, Nevada at the time. And, and the airplane, the airline's maintenance base was my home airport. And it was out there on the ramp with a for sale sign on it one day. And I wandered out and I kind of, you know, you know, and, um, but the problem was they had two for sale and they were for, literally like a song and a dance and you could have both of them. Um, but the idea of buying two DC threes seemed just one half step beyond marginally insane. Yeah. So I decided not to do it, um, which in retrospect was a dumb decision, but you know, anyway, so, uh, so somebody bought them both and then, you know, a couple of years later, it came back up for sale. It wasn't flying. It was sitting. It was sitting. It was in horrible condition, and and mm -hmm. I bought it. So, um, you know, we we've talked about that piece of it, <clears throat> but um, the only thing dumber than owning a DC three would be flying one over open water. So mm -hmm. why not? Um, so Eric refused to talk me out of it. We um, went through the whole planning process to uh, that you go through to operate an eighty year old airplane and you know fly or you know. 80 year old design, a 75 year old airplane to fly it across 3,300 miles of the North Atlantic. Um, yes. The North Atlantic is a formidable ocean. And in modern transportation, we've kind of forgotten that because, you know, we zip right on up to the high 30s and join the tracks and off you go. Um, yeah. Everything that takes place down below 15,000 feet is violent. Um, icing. Um, winds, the, um, I mean, it is an incredibly complex weather forecasting environment because of its size, uh, because of how few weather stations there are. Um, they can tell you what the jet stream is going to do and they're right all the time. Yes. They really can't tell you what's going to take place down low. So when you start talking about flying a piston engine airplane across the Atlantic, it's, um, it's, you know, it's gut check time. Um, yeah. so we put together a plan, um, and I, Took it. I shopped it around to a couple of people that I thought would talk me out of it, and nobody did. Um, it took us six months of solid full-time planning to get the airplane ready to go and the crew ready to go. And um, we set out across the Atlantic. Um, we had uh, there were two of us that were captains, uh, uh, me and Eric, um, uh, and then we had um, we had uh, six co-pilots, two mechanics. And um, Casey, who is our um, our DC three expert mechanic, uh, and Paul, who I've I've poked fun of a bunch of times. Um, so Casey and Paul came along, um, and then we had uh, we had four co pilots, um, and we basically set it up so that you know Eric and I did the takeoffs and landings. And so as soon as we hit cruise, one of us would go back and do the crew rest for half the flight, and the co pilots would rotate through that person's seat, and then it. Right at the ETP, we would, the two captains would switch and then the co-pilots would rotate through the other seat. And so, yeah. um, because hand flying a DC three IMC through ice and snow and rain, um, four, five, six, seven hour legs is exhausting. Oh, um, and so, so we did this rotation, um, and it worked out actually, we, we were probably overstaffed for what we needed, but, uh, but it worked out perfectly. We got absolutely the luck of the draw we got the you know we got horrific snowstorms uh in northern canada that's that we got stuck for a couple of days mm -hmm. um we went up to greenland uh we had an absolutely easy time going to greenland um i had the first crew rest um and there's there's video on youtube uh, matt guthmiller who's a friend of mine um did yeah. a he videoed our series. I don't know if you've seen it, but I have. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that, you know, th there's that whole thing about vibration and stuff when we took off out of, um, out of, uh, we took off out of Goose Bay and yeah. people have, have said to me, you know, was that done for dramatization? And, um, and my answer to that is no, he actually dialed it down. We were more nervous about the health of the airplane than I think is evident um, okay. in that, video um and there's you know and, and matt captured some moments that i just I, I i love to go back and watch it because um 
you can see some really neat elements of crew resource management in that period. You know, mm -hmm. I turned to Casey. Casey's our lead mechanic. He knows everything there is to know about my airplane. And I turned, you know, I'm pilot in command. I can do whatever I want. But I turned to Casey and said, is there any reason why you think we should not go out over water? And his response is no, let's keep going. Right. And and that's when I stopped worrying. And you can actually see me like you, the, 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 the veil of concern go away. And I'm like, yeah. you know, if Casey's not concerned, all I got to do is just keep the airplane pointed in the right direction. My job's yeah. easy. Yes. Um, so we, uh, you know, we, we, I got the first crew rest and I went back and fell asleep and, and I had been up for days at this point. I was exhausted. Um, you know, we would land and go to the hotel and, and we'd all have dinner and pat each other on the back and talk about what a great job we'd done and everybody go to their rooms and go to sleep. Um, and, the way I like to tell the story, whether it's true or not, is that because, you know, they were all just willing participants. They all went to sleep and, you know, slept blissfully. Yeah. I, as soon as I got into my room, I'd start worrying about the next day and it's customs and it's flight planning and it's, you know, weather forecasting yeah. and it's fuel load planning. And it's, you know, do we have all the documents and paperwork and stamps and all the other stuff we need to cross borders and all this other garbage that goes on. It must I'd have taken it. some time to come down from the excitement of the, of the last leg as well. It, yeah, it did. Yeah. Um, some of my favorite memories um, of my entire flying career to this point are when we would all go for dinner mm. after landing those nights. Um, you know, the, our first night um, we had dinner in, you know, we made it to Montreal. Yeah. Not terribly difficult. We'd cross back and forth across the country in the U S a couple of times going to Montreal. wasn't terribly difficult, but somehow it felt like an accomplishment. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. It was really good. It was, really, and we had this wonderful team dinner and we, we had a ball. Um, yeah. And the next night we got stuck in Montreal and um, uh, Mikey and, and his girlfriend took us out to dinner and we all sat there at this restaurant with, and, and Mikey treated us like we were, like we were family and, and I, and, I, and people overuse that phrase, but literally we sat at the table. You would have thought Mikey did not have like his own pressure cooker going on. He was relaxed. We joked, we laughed. We, we had such a wonderful time. They drove us around, you know, they got us moved back and forth to places. They ensured that we had everything we needed. Um, I mean, it was such a fun night and, you know, then go to the hotel and now my stress level goes through the roof. Cause I got to worry about everything that's going on tomorrow. Yeah, we get yeah. goose bay, we get snowed in. Um, you know, we literally there, there's not much to do in goose, so we all just kind of wandered around like vagrants. Um, <laughs> and the next day, we're getting ready to leave, and and um, Chris um, wanders over this baron, pulls up next to us, and Chris has a thing for barons, and he goes over and he's poking his nose against the glass of this baron, which was a huge mistake because I think the guy flying the baron would not have noticed Chris if Chris weren't looking at the Baron. And so this guy had just flown in from, from Greenland where we were going. And he turned to Chris and he said, you guys are going up to, to, to Narsarsawak. And Chris said, yeah. And he shook his head and he said, that's a suicide run today. I'd think twice about it. And he walked away. Bloody hell, right? Okay. And, and literally, you know, while this is going on, like I'm yeah. in the cockpit, we've got the clearance, we've got everything programmed, we're fueled, yeah. we're ready to go. <laughs> yeah. and, and, like, and, and we've got, you know, some great, you know, pilots, you know, with a tremendous amount of experience in a whole bunch of different parts of the world. It weren't, none of us are seeing anything bad. And all of a sudden, you know, Chris wanders up and he's like, Hey, you know, this dude. Mm. And so, you know, we're pulling out the flight plans and we're looking through like, what are we missing? Like, mm. you know, cause the, the, the thing about flying is you never want to leave yourself without an out, always have a plan B. Um, yeah. You know, what aviation has done to me is it has made me professionally paranoid. I don't get up in the morning and make a cup of coffee without a plan B. I always right. know what I'm going to do if that if the coffee maker fails, I have a backup plan. Yeah. I never get caught without one. Yeah. Um, and flying the DC-3 to Narsarsoak, when we reach ETP going to Nars, as soon as we cross that ETP, there is only one airport in the world that we can reach. And this is the first time in my flying career that I have had that experience. There's there's some folks out there who do it on a regular basis. I'm not one of yeah. them. Um, yeah. And, you know, I come out of the 121 air carrier world. Um, I come out of, you know, flying biz jets. We don't ever leave the ground 
with no plan B. You don't do it. It's not safe. But here we were intentionally going out over the north, of, over well, over the, the, the Greenland Sea to fly to a runway that two and a half hours before we get there, we have to decide if it's going to you if it's going to work for us. And if it's not going to work for us, we have to decide to go back. Mm. And if we make the wrong decision, now we're talking about putting the airplane into a bay. We're talking about putting the airplane onto a glacier. We're talking about putting everyone's lives at risk. And, you know, and we talked about that earlier. Um, and so I got the first crew rest. I go back. I'm exhausted. I, you know, it's slightly deoxygenated too, I, you know, because we're up at like 11,000 feet. I right. fell asleep, probably the, the soundest sleep I've ever had. I mean, I'm, you know, we had a little cot back there. We called it the captain's rest. Um, and I put my eye mask on, out cold, sound asleep. Right. A couple hours later, we're coming up on ETP and Chris, you know, Eric sends Chris back to wake me up and Chris shakes me awake and I jolted awake. Um, I mean, like, you know, like a spring loaded mousetrap. Yeah. And the first thing Chris said to me was he was like, everything's OK. Collect yourself. Eric wants to see you. <laughs> <laughs> And I sat there trying to get my heart rate I back. I can imagine down. that feeling. Yeah. You know, when someone's that, just told you it's a suicide mission and then you get yeah, shaken away. You know, and, oh and it's, um, and it was funny because I, you know, I was in such a deep sleep, you know, you wake up and there's that, like, where the hell am I? Yeah, um, yeah. you know, I'm not used to falling asleep on a DC three over the Greenland sea. So, no. you know, I went up and we convinced over things and we looked things over and um, we had one of our crewmates uh, back home, uh, Lindy, who, um, uh, you know, a marvelous human being. He and I fly the the, the biz jet together, and um, Lindy uh, was our he was our our guide back at home, and he was going to keep an eye on things, and we could communicate with him uh, via satellite through text messaging, yeah. um, sort of like you know we had CPDLC on the on the on the DC three, yeah. And um, so Lindy chose that moment to choke on a chicken bone in a sandwich that he was eating. Um, he didn't do it intentionally, obviously, but so right as we're approaching ETP, Lindy's in the ER trying to get a chicken bone extracted from his throat. And all of a sudden we're out there like, where is he? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're roaring up on ETP. We're looking at, the, you know, the set, we've got satellite weather. We're looking at forecasts. There's eight of us involved in the decision making. Well, maybe, maybe six, I think. Casey and Paul were in the back taking bets on whether we were going to screw it up. Um, and <laughs> we, um, you know, we, we, all the data matched what we were seeing on the forecast. The trends were all exactly what we thought we should see. And yeah. we continued on. And what we were rewarded with was this magnificently beautiful, clear day landing in Narsarsuak, which is a legendary airport for DC three pilots. Um, and, you know, we got to land there and we, 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 you know, that dinner was fun. Um, yeah. you know, the next day we flew to Iceland. The last day is hilarious because the last day it felt, we woke up in the morning, like we were already in a celebratory mood and we had the longest overwater leg that we were going to fly still ahead of us. And we did right. the whole thing in icing conditions. I mean, the airplane looked like a popsicle. Yeah. Um, and we were very concerned about fuel range and usage and, you know, the winds didn't quite do what we wanted them to do. We were going to land pretty close to minimum fuel when we got to Prestwick. So, you know, there's some of that's covered in the video as well that we, you know, we had a whole system down for managing fuel and, um, you know, we made it to Prestwick. That dinner was fun. We, you know, we yeah. made it to, uh, to Duxford and the, the leg from Prestwick to Duxford was dull because we were over, we're over land now. Like this is yeah. easy. Yeah. Um, but the, one of the funniest things that happened one of my favorite sort of like you know okay how dumb can you be moments in the entire journey was on the flight home eric and i are flying um the rest of the crew we know we just had we everybody had sort of conflicting life things and, and eric and i flew the airplane back with kc only so it was the two of us going back the weather was beautiful it was going to be nice and flying from iceland back to greenland the weather was so clear and so calm that we, after a little bit of searching, were able to find the reflection of the airplane. We're at, you know, at, at I think we were at um, 11,000 going back, um, or sorry, at, at uh, uh, 12,000 going back. And um, we were able to find the reflection of the airplane on the surface of the ocean, you know, crossing the, you know, the, the, the Bismarck Straits. Yeah. 
which is extraordinary. I yeah. mean, that area of ocean is never calm, and it was like glass. I mean, it, the, there were a couple of clouds, and you could see their reflection on the surface of the water like it was a mirror. I mean, it was magnificent. And we're chugging along, and we've got our whole fuel management process going. And, you know, the two of us are just, you know, we're talking about all the stuff we usually talk about when we're flying the airplane. And then we roll up on the Greenland coast, and we've got a fuel transition point coming. We're well ahead of the fuel plan. The winds are in our favor. Everything's going well. And... We just, we need to switch from the ox tanks to the main tanks. And, yeah. but then we start to notice all the icebergs and the cliffs and the, and the you know, the, 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 the Greenland ice cap. If you've never laid eyes on it for real, add it to your bucket list. Going and seeing it is extraordinary. I, I mean, yes. I've flown all over the world. I've never <laughs> seen anything like this um and seeing it from you know the high 30s doesn't do it justice when, no, when you're it. looking at it and it's above you and you know and, yeah. and you realize just how deep it is and it was really cool and so the two of us are completely enthralled we're you know we with the windows open you know we're you know like two dogs with our heads hung out the window mm, mm, mm. and the right engine quit um mm. i mean it oh, just man. there was no hint of an issue it just quit yeah. and eric caught it because he's smarter than i am um his brain works at about you know three times my brain speed he was on the fuel gauges immediately and saw the fuel flow needle flicker and you know i just reacted to what the airplane was doing and immediately went in with rudder and you know and, and reached up grabbed the mixture or the throttle and pulled it to idle because I figured if it had been as a temporary fuel interruption and it suddenly gets fuel back, you run the risk of blowing a cylinder head off the engine. And so you really don't, oh, right. want, to, yeah. you don't want to make an easy problem worse. So yeah. I, just, yeah. you know, the, 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 without thinking automatic response was pull the throttle to idle. And then I reached for the mixture and pulled it back as well. Mm. And Eric's already got, you know, that he, I mean, in, in the, as fast as you can think, he's got the fuel tank switch, the boost pump on, and he's watching the pressure come back up. And I let it have the mixture and, you know, could feel it catching and slowly work the throttle back in and, you know, bring the rudder back out and get everything all balanced again. And, you know, okay, yeah, we're back on, yeah. out the and, you know, try to suppress the heart rate. Cause you literally like my heart's like right about here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my and God, I looked at Eric and he looked at me and I said, oh, and we immediately switched the other tank because, you know, when you lose one, you're going to lose the other. So and I looked at Eric and I said, act like nothing happened. And the two of us are just sitting there, you know. <laughs> yeah. And poor Casey, who has been asleep for the last three hours in the back of the airplane, you know, having you know dreams of home or, you know, whatever he was yeah. dreaming of. Blissfully unaware. And, who, and Casey, who has... It takes a tremendous amount of personal professional pride in the fact that this airplane has operated without a single squawk for 110 hours of flying all over the Atlantic and Europe. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. this is his baby. Yeah. Um, I might pay the bills, but it's his airplane. Yeah. And all of a sudden we hear his headset click into the, the intercom. You just hear that click as the, yeah. as the you know, the, and the two of us are sitting there and he leans into the flight deck and he <laughs> looks at me and he looks at Eric yeah. And he looks at the engines. He looks at me. <laughs> Unplugged. And he walks back. He doesn't say a thing. All right. And Eric and I sat there, the two of us, we laughed the whole rest of the way to Greenland. And when we <laughs> land, I, you know, we were just like, he's going to give us hell when we get on the ground. And when we land, he hasn't said anything and he hasn't said anything and he hasn't said anything. And, you know, we're putting the airplane to bed because we're spending the night in Greenland. Yeah. And all of a sudden we're, you know, we're walking over to the hotel because it's right next to the airport and we're walking over to the hotel and he's standing between us and he just says, and I'll, I'll, I won't throw the profanity into it. He goes, that is a lousy effing way to be woken up. And that's <laughs> all he ever said. <laughs> and, and he never offered any other criticism and, and he's never brought it up since. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's all two, it needed to be said. <laughs> the, these two dumb pilots of his, um, you know, <laughs> jarred him awake. Um, but the, you know, the, the other, um, you know, I, I talked about proficiency and, and that sort of thing, you know, at this point in, in our story, Eric and I, have, we've flown the airplane 110 hours in the last four weeks. Um, we are as in tune with each other as a crew and with the airplane as we could possibly be. And, and the next leg of the journey was back into Goose Bay. Um, 
And we got a phone call from the, the, the handler in Goose Bay saying that they had discovered they had a crack in their underground tank and all of their 100 octane aviation fuel was, was contaminated. And they only had a thousand liters left and it's what's in the truck. And what followed was me negotiating, trying to buy the fuel in the truck from them over the phone, which they wouldn't do. And they said, you know, look, right. legally, we have to be first come first serve. We can't do that. So we're yeah. looking at all the, you know, the weather and the winds, and there's another DC three there and they have another, an alternate path to get home to, to Montana through Northern Canada. And so, but we had a weather system that covered most of the East, most of the Northeastern Canada, you know, that, that area. Yeah. And there was almost no place that we could go um, in fuel range where we could land without having to shoot an approach to about, you know, 200 and 200 foot overcast and a half mile visibility. And so we really labored over whether we were going to go or not. And the weather forecast at, at Goose Bay wasn't all that bad. So we decided, all right, we're going to go. And we had an 80 knot tailwind the whole way there. So we were well ahead of the fuel burn plan and things were going swimmingly. <clears throat> and as we start the descent into Goose Bay, we are listening to the forecast and the weather and it's getting worse and it's getting worse and it's getting worse. And it, if you've ever read um, Fate is the Hunter, it started to feel like we were having an Ernest Gann moment. Everything was was turning against us. And mm -hmm. the airplane was icing up and the, it was turbulent as all get out. And it was it was bumpy. And a, you know, a DC-3 doesn't like to maintain, it, it just, DC-3s like stable air. And when it's bumpy, you know, you're fighting the whole time and it's a hard airplane to fly and it's exhausting. And um, we wound up shooting an RNAV approach into Goose Bay. Um, probably the most challenging instrument approach I have ever flown. Um, there were times where I had full control deflection on the ailerons and full rudder in, and the airplane was still rolling away from the control inputs. Wow. Um, the, you know, trying to keep the airplane on the glide path. Um, I was making pitch inputs that were so extraordinary as to be concerning. Um, I started to lose faith in whether the instruments were being honest with me because it didn't seem possible that I should be able to get near the control limits um, on the, you know, on pitch control and have the airplane do what it seemed to be doing. Um, so I was trying to fly the airplane from my instruments and Eric's because they're on different systems. So, you know, is that working? Um, and I thought I saw ground contact and I did something extraordinarily stupid. Um, yeah. And they tell you never to do this, but I did it anyway, because, you know, maybe they're wrong. I looked down at the ground contact. And when I did, there's water swirling on the window, on the side window of the airplane. And when I went like this, I got vertigo. And all of a sudden, I felt like I was in, like, sitting in my desk chair, rotating in a circle. Oh, um, goodness me. Yeah. And I couldn't maintain pitch and roll. I had a, I could do one at a time, but I couldn't do both. It was frightening. Yes. So now here's, you know, I'm sitting next to me is, is Eric, incredibly skilled airline captain, a guy who, I mean, I fly with him all the time. I've flown with yeah. him everywhere. And I, and I, I think the world of him yeah. and he and I know each other extremely well. And I said to him, I need help. I have vertigo. And he said, which way? And I don't remember what I answered. And he said to me, he either told me he had pitch or roll and I forget which one he took from me. And I, yeah. maintained the other one. so now literally the two of us are flying a coupled approach in a DC three because I'm working one channel. He's working the other. Yes. And, and, and we just keep plowing down this approach. And all of a sudden it was like, you know, and meanwhile, my head is literally like spinning in all directions and it was making me a little bit nauseated. This is the stuff of nightmares. This really is the stuff of nightmares. This is the stuff where I start like thinking back to that promise I made to myself that the last thing I think wouldn't be, well, that was a bad idea. Yes. Yeah. You, know, you start to really, I mean, it was, it was actually, you know, it, you know, there's the whole like male bravado BS that goes on in aviation. It was actually, to be quite honest, it was very frightening. Um, I oh, was cool. scared. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're, we're wrestling this approach and we know we're surrounded by rising terrain of, you know, un, that we're not necessarily familiar with what's underneath us, but it's, you know, it's changing terrain and, you know, keep the localizer and the glide path together. Um, and, you know, there's, there's ice on and off the airplane and heavy rain and light rain and all of a sudden, poof, 
we're below this absolutely solid undercast layer, about 250 feet AGL. Yeah. And the winds are howling and it's the rain's blowing sideways, but the world stopped spinning because all of a sudden I could see. Um, and I yeah. said to Eric, I got it and got the airplane sort of, you know, back into, you know, my little box and we get into the flare and we roll out and I'm setting the tail down and the tower controller calls us. And he said, uh, he said, Hey, you know, we see, we've got a flight plan for you guys continuing on to, uh, to Bangor, Maine. He said, have you had enough for the day or do you want their clearance? And yeah. the two of us laughed and <laughs> Eric looked at me and I looked at him and I said, you know, give me a few minutes. And let me think this one over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, um, it was absolutely the most challenging approach I've ever flown. And, yeah. and what it, what it speaks to me about is the value of flying with someone whose skills you trust, who, who knows you, knows your training, knows your background, knows how you think, flying an airplane that the two of you are incredibly familiar with um, yes. so that you can operate the airplane together and rely upon each other's skill level and fly the airplane safely. Um, and so it was a very dangerous operation for a couple of minutes there. Um, but the outcome was never really in jeopardy because we could rely upon each other. So mm that kind of segues us back to what we talked about in the beginning of our, of, you know, of our, of our time together. Um, you know, why did I sell the DC three? Well, you know, it's hard to maintain that level of proficiency. And, and yes. when we get through COVID and all the other challenges of, you know, life and scheduling and stuff, um, I don't ever want to find myself in a situation in an airplane where I run out of, you know, options and ideas at the same time. And, and yeah. for that airplane, I think the time had come. So we, so we let her go. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah. So anyway, that, you know, and there's, um, you know, there's a million stories I could tell you about what it's like flying a DC three around Europe, but you know, maybe we'll save those for next time. Another, yeah. Next time. Absolutely. That was what, what a way to end. We can't go from that back to MSFS questions. We can't, I'm sorry. That is, that is how we will end things today. Um, but Rob, thank you ever so much for all your time and, uh, and your insight. It's been a fascinating chat. Um, I think everyone has learned a lot. Thank you to everyone who has ask, asked such good questions. And I'm really sorry we haven't got through all of them. Um, we will, I really hope, do this again. Um, Mods, you've done an amazing job of highlighting the questions. Thank you ever so much. And a big, big thank you. Murph, hello. I don't know if you're still here. Thank you for the raid. I've had to silence all the alerts. I haven't been able to say hello or goodbye to anyone um, because it just wouldn't have been appropriate. But I really appreciate all of your support, everyone who has been here. Um, my next general stream is going to be on Sunday at uh, 1400 Zulu, and it's going to be the launch of Euregio, which I haven't talked about this evening because, again, it wouldn't have been appropriate. But you all should come and join Euregio, which is the, uh, the virtual airline um, of the channel. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I hope to see you there. Some of you I'll see tomorrow for the Club Philbert uh, group flight, and we're going to the Rocky Mountains in Canada for some beer fast. That'll be nice. Um, but yeah, Rob, final words from you. Um, final words to you, really, not from me. I think you've said enough. Thank you ever so much once again. And, You're welcome. Uh, and, you know, and, and if I can, you know, I mean, thank you. Uh, you know, this this whole community um, has seen a resurgence uh, over the past couple of years. That that you know, it it comes in part. Um, because of Microsoft's investment in the community, but um, but it it comes from you know folks like you that are building these streams and building these channels and helping to you know teach people to gain more satisfaction out of their out of their simming um, and building a sense of community. So you know thanks for inviting me to come in and, and chat with you for a little while um, and you know to all of you out there who are PMDG customers. Um, Thanks. Uh, you know, you guys are incredibly supportive of us and we, we see it, we hear it. Um, we genuinely appreciate it. The whole team appreciates it. Um, and on behalf of all the guys that, you know, that don't get to sit here and, you know, be the, you know, the, the, the glorified mouthpiece, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, you know, that the Vins and the Jasons and Vangelis um, and, you know, Paul and Chris's and everybody else, you know, Hey, we appreciate it. So thank you for, for your support for us. It means a great deal. Thank you. And uh, yeah, with that, I shall bid you good night and uh, speak to you soon. Take All right. Care. All right. Good night. Bye-bye.